The board will now come to order. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Schweitzer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Vollmer. Alderman Velasquez. Alderman Sanye. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Alderman Keys. Alderman Tyus. Alderman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Present. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cone. Alderman Velasquez. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Keys. Here. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, ma'am. 11 present. You have quorum. Quorum being present will be led in opening reflection and prayer by Pastor John Watson G. Those that would join us, I will speak from the Holy Scriptures. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. We pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, as we enter the door of another day, let it be with the frame of mind that we are working for you and with our fellow board members on behalf of our great city. Allow your spirit to have full sway in our hearts and in the hearts of our people. Let discord and division be removed and turned into productive dialogue and discussion. Let all dissension and discrimination be erased. Make us mindful that we are dependent upon each other, that we need each other, and that we must learn to live together. Help us to respect the rights of others and then help others to respect our rights. Above all, remind us that we are here only for a little while and will stand before you. At that time, may we be unafraid, unashamed, because we have been faithful in our service and stewardship to you and our great city. And to your arms we commit ourselves, our family, our community, our city. Amen. Amen. Special order of the day. If all, we're not doing that anymore? All. All right, then we will dispense with line item number four. Any introduction of honored guests? Alderwoman from the 10. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Of course, I'll start by having my honored guests, all of the women, all of the women down here at the Board of Honor, all of the women that show up in their spaces every day on International Women's Day. I honor you. I respect you. And I'm so uh, grateful to be able to serve with you down here, starting, of course, with our very own woman that made history, our first president of board, female president, woman president of the Board of Alderman, Megan Green. And then I will also have, uh, as my honor guest, whom we just heard from, Pastor John Watson. Pastor John Watson worships and lives in the 10th Ward. I'm so proud to service his older woman. He has been a solid rock in the community. And Pastor Watson, I bet you thought we forgot, but your birthday is coming up on Sunday. Happy birthday, Pastor Watson. The best is yet to come. Alderman from the 4th. Uh, thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, I'd like to have Patrick McDonough and the uh, Ancient Order of Hibernians as my special guest today. Uh, we have uh, a resolution coming up later. Uh, to uh, honor uh, this month as Irish American History Month and uh, looking to raise the tricolor uh, in front of uh, City Hall. Uh, for many, many years now, the Ancient Order of Hibernians have uh, 
uh, put on a parade in Dogtown, actually on St. Patrick's Day, unlike the, uh, the city parade. Uh, that came as a result of a lot of uh, political disagreement, ultimately, in between uh, the, the, the city and the Irish American community. And uh, I'd just like to thank him for his efforts and continuing to spearhead that parade over the last, uh, I guess it's near 40 years now. Uh, so uh, thank you to him, and I'd like to have him as my honored guest. Thanks. Thanks. Alderman from the 14th. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I want to echo uh, the words from the Alderman from the 10th. I just want to, uh, as my honored guest, have all the uh, fabulous women down here that I'm able to serve with and learn with from staff all the way down to all the people um, on this International Women's Day. If it wasn't for a woman, there wouldn't be uh, as many great men that we have throughout this world. So I just want to thank all the amazing women um, that's getting stuff done, as well as the older woman said, uh, a historic moment to have our very own first uh, woman president at this Board of Aldermen. Also, as my honored guest, uh, Sheriff of the City of St. Louis, 14 World Residents, and uh, all his deputies that are here in the building uh, as well. And then a very special friend who I think is in the gallery, Maxi Glamour. He's a resident of the Third Ward, but a very good friend, a advocate for the LGBTQIA uh, movement just this week as Jefferson City continues to try to not just ban books, but also drag shows. Uh, they were up there advocating for the right for people to be able to uh, have these drag shows. And if the Republicans don't want to go to them, they don't have to go to them, but they shouldn't stop uh, people from being able to express themselves, love who they want to love, and to be able to advocate for things that are right. So uh, to Maxie is a, a gem in the city of St. Louis, an advocate that is uh, well needed in this city and not just advocates in this city, but throughout uh, the whole country. So thank you, Maxie, and thank you to all the rest of my honored guests. Any further introduction of honored guests? Alderman from the third. Thank you, Madam President. I, too, uh, want to just extend my welcome to my constituent and friend, uh, Maxi Glamour. Um, appreciate all of the work that they do uh, across the state and in the city, elevating LGBTQ queer voices, and um, particularly for your efforts this week down in Jefferson City. Um, you look fabulous. Any further introduction of honor guests? Alder Madam President, members of the board, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kevin Smoot, who is a now resident of the 12th Ward and is also a childhood friend of my husband. They've been friends for a long, long time. I'm not going to say how much. And I graduated from St. Louis University High School. Any further introduction of honored guests? Any further introduction of honored guests? With that, I think our special order of the day is here now. Okay, then we are going to go back to... For Alderwoman from the 13th, if you would like to approach the dais. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ms. Thank you, Ms. President. I'm going to uh, lean to Alderwoman from the 12th because I wanted to make sure that we did things in order, and so she will do the special order today. Okay. Alderwoman, if you want to approach the dais. Good morning. I have the pleasure of doing resolution number, I don't know which number this is, 205, honoring Antoinette Cousins. I don't have any children, but if I had a daughter, and I call her my daughter, um, she would be as fabulous as Antoinette Cousins. Antoinette Cousins is the uh, daughter of the older woman from the 13th, but she is a leader in our community, starting with she is the president of the St. Louis Public School Board, which they do a lot of work. I have the pleasure of honoring Antoinette Cousins on Women's History Day, just right after Black History Day. It, and I'd like to have the clerk read the resolution because it's so small <laughs> that, uh, and do you have it, Madam Clerk? 
Uh, I have it. Okay, please. Thank you. Resolution 205, honoring Antoinette Cousins. Whereas Antoinette Cousins, a forward-thinking visionary who works tirelessly to develop new concepts while fulfilling her calling to serve the residents of the St. Louis region. Whereas in March 2002, Ms. Cousins began her journey with Riverview West Florissant Development Corporation, where she directed its day-to-day -day operations, oversaw and assumed ultimate responsibilities for effective planning and implementation of initiative programs and business opportunities developed by the organization. Since then, she has developed over 100 units of new and rehab housing and has created and implemented several programs, including TMAP Nuisance Beautification Lawn Care, Handyman Critical Property Repair Programs. So now we know it's not just us. <laughs> oh, look at here, somebody to the rest. <laughs> testing, testing, I'm sorry. She provided cor corporate leadership, strategic direction, and inscrutable approach to effective management. Her efforts have allowed her to serve as a well-respected source of information and insight for local and national funders political leaders, businesses, and civic organizations, all while be accountable to a board of directors as an executive officer of a nonprofit corporation. Whereas Ms. Cousins attributes her foundation work, Riverview West Florissant Development Corporation, has earned and sustained an immaculate record of accomplishments in conducting the business of improving the overall conditions of the community. Whereas in 2013, she spearheaded the creation of the Baden Enrichment STEM Center. In 2016, IMK Kids, I'm sorry, AMI Kids selected Miss Cousins to serve as the di executive director for AMI Kids St. Louis. During her tenure, Miss Cousins was able to secure $450,000 in grants. Wow. <laughs> Successfully, 250 students who completed the AMI Kids program with 20% receiving their high school diploma before returning to their home school. During her three-year tenure, AMI Kids St. Louis became the top program out of 48 programs across the AMI Kids Network, earning various awards and accolades. Whereas over the last three years, Ms. Cousins has utilized her skills, knowledge, and professional insight in assisting grassroots nonprofits in implementing various programs. She currently works as the Community Outreach Manager for Missouri Housing Commission. Whereas Ms. Cousins is currently pursuing her PhD in human services with a concentration in nonprofit management. She holds a master's of business in nonprofit management from Fonbot University, a master's of science in human resource management and development from National Lewis University, and a bachelor of science in social work from Central Missouri State University. She is a proud member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and a St. Louis native. Now, therefore, let it be resolved by the Board of Aldermen of the City of St. Louis that we pause in our deliberation to recognize and honor Antoinette Cousins for her significant contributions to the betterment of our city and its residents. We further direct the Clerk of the Board of Aldermen to spread a resolution across the minutes of these proceedings and prepare a commemorative copy to the end that it may be presented to the honoree at a time and place deemed appropriate by the sponsor. Introduced this 8th day of March, 2024, by the Honorable Pamela Boyd, Alder Woman of the 13th Ward. Thank you. Even though her mother did this resolution, she didn't do credit to Tony Cousins, okay? She did not put all the wonderful things that Tony Cousins does in this 
us in this city. I talked about a few months ago, I went to something at the library that I never thought I would see in my life. And they had a literacy day, invited black authors to come and present, and you had to stand in line to get into the library downtown. You had to, it took you half an hour to actually park. That is something, I wanna see that done again. As a child, I loved to read. I loved, to, my mother would drop us off at the library and they had what we call the Princess Tower indicator. And we would go up in that tower and they had all kinds of things happening for children. And so we, we learned a love of reading. Children who read really do really well in school. So um, this idea of working with the public library was so fantastic. I hope they do it two or three times a year. Anything that we can do as the board, we should. She, I heard, uh, one of the former um, members of the Board of Aldermen talked about the things that she did, not only in South St. Louis, the things she did across uh, the city of St. Louis, the things that she did working for former Alderman Greg Carter and her and Alderwoman Boyd, the things that she does for anything in the, in, in the city of St. Louis. If you ask her to come to a meeting, she's there. If you don't ask her to come to a meeting, she still comes there. That's the kind of person that I really love being head of the St. Louis Public Schools and like to read about all these other things, but my heart is about the St. Louis Public Schools. We gotta let people know how really important uh, having public education is. Everybody cannot go to a public, I mean a private school, and to have somebody at the head of the school board who gets it and um, wants us to know how important that is and ha then be able to do all these other things, that is fantastic, thank you. Tony Cousin, and she's part of a power couple. I'm not gonna say the other name, but she's part of a power couple, but she in her own right is a powerful black woman, and I salute you. Thank you, Tony Cousins, and if you have anything to say, I'd like to give you the opportunity at this time to come to the mic and address the full board of aldermen. Thank you. The only thing I really have to say is I must really be in trouble because she has the honorary Antoinette Cousins, and I really don't go by Antoinette, I go by Tony, so. Um, the only thing I, I really want to share is I do love everything about my city, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and I will continue to fight for the betterment of all in regards to the city of St. Louis, specifically those in St. Louis Public Schools and the children as a whole. And what Alder Woman Tyus is saying is true. Literacy for the Lou was just the beginning. That day we had well over 4,000 people participate in the event for reading and launching that, that type of event, but we will do it on a regular basis. So please look for more, and we are definitely work in alignment with the Board of Aldermen as a whole as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 10th. Let me make sure we are. Okay, thank you, Madam President, members of the I would definitely be remiss if I didn't rise as a proud public school parent here in the city. The first say thank you, right? Listen, I know our family connections. We have so many connections that go back generations to generations. So I've seen you in services in so many different spaces. But again, I want to make sure today on International Women's Day that I lift you up in everything you do as a woman, as a wife, as a mother here in the city of St. Louis, you have seen, you don't just talk about it, you have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you still show up. So again, as a proud parent, public school parent, thank you, continue to work, and know that you have our support 100%. Alder woman from the seventh. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I almost was gonna say that Ms. Cousins was my special guest today, but I didn't wanna mess up the presentation. Um, but I had the honor of Ms. Cousins on the Board of Education, and I have seen her tireless work. The Board of Education is extremely hard work. When you take it seriously, your work is never done, and it is unpaid. Um, I want to make sure I commend you for everything you've been doing, from literacy in the loo to selecting a new superintendent. Um, I know you guys are working on some other plans that you'll be announcing with the city soon. To even start in a legislative you know, committee at the Board of Autumn and starting to participate in conversations, 
I know one of the things you all have talked a lot about is the voucher program and what a threat that is to our public school district. And so I just want to uplift all of the work and all of the leadership that you're showing. And of course, um, I served with you and now I get to be your older woman. So I definitely want to make sure I give you a special shout out and just make sure that I thank you for your thankless work. And if you think people don't see it or people don't know, I want you to know that I see it and I know it. And however, we can uplift it, resolutions for the things you all are doing whatever we could do to support. I really want to see um, sometimes some of the silos that exist between the Board of Aldermen and the school district. I want to see those go away because at the end of the day, the kids are our future and the youth are our fastest declining population. So I just think that's extremely important. So thank you, sis, for your leadership. And please don't hesitate to let me know how I can support any of you all's efforts. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 13th. Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Because uh, Ottawa and Ty is kind of related to what I'm getting ready to say. When you have a child in St. Louis Public Schools and they have given up on your child, and Tony was one of those children, and we were determined we were not going to quit. And so when you see all those degrees, that was her coming back to where she came from and said, pow, what you got for me next time? So thank you. <laughs> in that fighter because you never quit yeah, okay. so it. thank you very much and I love you baby Alder woman Alder woman why don't you come up on the dais as well please <laughs> <laughs> Older woman from the seventh. Um, I would like to make a motion that we invent this. Is there a second? It's been moved by the older woman from the seventh, seconded by the older woman from the tenth that we embank resolution number 205. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Thank you. Normally, before a person that you're presenting a um, resolution to, you present the resolution. I did not feel comfortable presenting this resolution. Pam has been a fabulous mother to this, and I wanted to present the resolution in connection. And I shouldn't say Pam, Alderwoman Boyd has been a fabulous parent, and she's raised a fabulous, not only daughter, but other children. And I wanted us to present this resolution together to her fabulous, our daughter, Antoinette, because <laughs> I've never called her that before. Antoine, the fabulous Antoinette cousin. Oops. Take a picture, I would yeah. appreciate it. And anybody, anyone who wants to join in taking a picture over here. Sorry. All right. Oh, my bad. Yeah, I got you. Trauma scares. All right. 
We'll go back to line item six, approval of the minutes. Alderwoman from the 10th, you're recognized on the approval of the minutes from Friday, March 1st, 2024. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we approve the minutes from Friday, March 1st, 2024. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we approve the minutes from Friday, March 1st, 2024. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Report of city officials. Report of city officials can be found in A, B, and C of the agenda and has been placed in the Google Drive for your review. Dear members of the board, I have the pleasure to submit the following individuals for reappointment to the Committee of the Plumbing Review. The reappointment of LaMarco Scales, the reappointment of Patrick Monahan, the reappointment of Michael Young, and the reappointment of Daryl Hunter. I respectfully request your approval of these appointments. Sincerely to Shara O. jones -Mayer. Alderman from the second, you are recognized on Mayor Jones' appointments to the Committee of Plumbing Review. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we um, move the committee, the mayor's appointments of the committee to the plumbing review to the public safety committee. Is there a second? It's been moved by the alderman from the second, seconded by the alderwoman from the seventh, that we send the mayor's appointments to the uh, committee of plumbing review to the public safety committee. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Okay. aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Dear members of the board, I have the pleasure to submit the following individuals for appointment to the Plumbers and Drainers Layers Drain Layers Board of Examiners, the reappointment of Matthew Scott Russell and the reappointment of Patrick Monahan. I respectfully request your approval of these appointments. Sincerely to Shara O. Jones Mayor. Alderman from the second, you are recognized a Mayor Jones appointments to the Plumbers and Drain Layers Board of Examiners. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I move that we send the mayor's appointments to the Plumbers and Drain Layers Board of Examiners to the Public Safety Committee. It's been moved by the alderman from the second, seconded by the alderwoman from the seventh, that we send Mayor Jones appointments uh, of the Plumbers and Drain Layers Board of Examiners to the Public Safety Committee. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Report of city, uh, sorry. Does anyone wish to take any bills or resolutions off of any of our informal calendars? Does anyone wish to take any bills or resolutions off of any of our informal calendars? Anyone wish to take any bills or resolutions off of any of our informal calendars? Seeing none, Alderwoman from the first, you are recognized on the motion for the suspension of the rules for the purposes of introducing board bills 240 and 241 for four, first reading. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move to suspend the rules to introduce board bill number 240 and 241 for first reading. It's been moved by the alderwoman from the first, seconded by the alderman from the third, that we suspend the rules as of introducing board bills number 240 and 241. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Aye. Alderman Balmer. Alderwoman Velasquez, Alderwoman Sanye, Alderwoman Spencer, Alderman Brownie, Alderwoman Clark Hubbard, Alderwoman Keys, Alderwoman Tyus. I'm sorry, can, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Alderwoman Tyus, Alderwoman Boyd, Aye. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Aye. 15 aye votes. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderwoman from the first to suspend the rules for introducing board bills number 240 and 241. Madam Clerk, if you could please place board bills 240 and 241 at the end of the first reading of board bills. So noted. First reading of board bills. <laughs> board bill 229 sponsored by oh, Alderman Cohn and ordinance amending ordinance number 6. 8481, amending said ordinance to include the electronic cigarettes as part of the applicability to city-owned facilities prohibiting regulating the act of smoking electronic cigarettes or not regulating smoking electronic cigarette use. De declaration of establishment as non-smoking and vaping, posting of signs, non-retaliation and enforcement 
contain a penalty clause, severability clause, effective date, and an elimination of exception. Board Bill 230, sponsored by Alderwoman Keys, an ordinance amending the St. Louis City Smoke-Free Air Act of 2009 by amending Section 1 of Ordinance Number 68481, codified in Section 11.31.020 of the Revised Code of the City of St. Louis to, divine, to define Tobacco Consumption Board and amending Section 7 of Ordinance Number 68481, codified in Section 11.31.070 of the Revised Code of the City of St. Louis to include Tobacco Consumption Board as an area where smoking is not regulated. Board Bill 231, sponsored by Alderman Narayan and President Green. An ordinance amending Ordinance Number 70796, adopting the 2018 International Fire Code with the changes set forth in Ordinance Number 70796. Board Bill 232, sponsored by Alderwoman Keys. An ordinance directing the Director of the City's Department of Health, Chief of St. Louis Fire Department, and the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Department to implement a program for a parent to deliver an infant to the care of the state without fear of prosecution or provided in Missouri's, Missouri's Safe Place for Newborns Act and to designate engine house and area patrol stations as location for receiving infants pursuant to the new Safe Place for Newborn Act and designating Fire Department Engine House 17 as such location contained an effective date. Board Bill 233, sponsored by Alder Woman Boyd, an ordinance prohibiting the wearing of facial covering when worn with the intent to intimidate or threaten another or to conceal one's identity in the commission of an unlawful activity and prohibiting the wearing of ski masks in certain areas of the city while on public transportation and in public trans transportation related to facilities or on private property without the express written permission of the owner, lawful tenant or occupant of the property, except as otherwise provided herein. Board Bill 234, sponsored by Alderwoman Clark Hubbard, an ordinance adding new sections to ordinance number 62124, which added sections pertaining to requirement for bidders for service contracts with the city for janitorial and security services containing a severability clause and effective date clause. Board Bill 235, sponsored by Alderwoman Keys, an ordinance relating to the appointment of and salaries of certain employees in the Sheriff's Office pursuant to Section 57.530, Revised Statutes of Missouri, by repealing Ordinance Number 71691, allocating certain other employees to agree with rate, including an emergency clause. The provision of the sections contained in this ordinance shall be effective with the start of the first pay period following approval by the Mayor. Board Bill 236, sponsored by Alderman, Alderman Narayan and President Green. An ordinance amending Section 3 of Ordinance Number 71620, codified in Chapter 3.160 of 030 of the City of St. Louis Revised Code of Ordinance, requiring applicants for a development proposal requesting a tax incentive to include information about previous tax incentives awarded to the same developer and previous tax incentives awarded to pass projects on the same parcel and requiring SLDC to share information about certain proposals with re relevant labor unions and organizations and requiring the applicants listed any past or existing agreements or contracts they have with labor organizations. Board Bill 236 sponsored by Alderwoman Tyus, pursuant to Ordinance Number 70333, as amended by Ordinance Number 71394, an ordinance directing the Director of Streets to install speed humps to calm the floor of traffic on the 4400 block of Sexer. Board Bill, I'm sorry, 237 sponsored by Alderwoman Tyus. Pursuant to Ordinance Number 70333, as amended by Ordinance Number 71394, an ordinance directing the Director of Streets to install speed humps to calm the floor of traffic on the 4400 block of Sexer, the 4600 blocks of Shirley Place, 4600 block of Richard Place, the 4600 block of Kenneth Place, the 4600 block of Court, the 4600 block of Bircher, the 45 through the 4600 blocks of Quarter, and the Penrose neighborhood, the 47 through the 4800 block of Greer, the 47 through the 4800 block of Lavity, the 47 through the 4800 block of Maffitt, the 47 through the 4800 block of Northland, 47 through the 4800 blocks of Couples, 47 through the 4800 block of Leduc, 47 through the 4800 block of Cole Brilliant, and the 48, 4700 block of Hammond Place in the Kings e, Kingsway East neighborhood, various blocks in the Ville, Greater Ville neighborhood. 
Board Bill 238, sponsored by Alderman Aldrich, pursuant to Ordinance Number 70333, as amended by Ordinance Number 71394, an ordinance directing the Director of Streets to install speed humps to calm the floor of traffic on certain blocks in the 14th Ward. Board Bill 239, sponsored by Alderman Velasquez, an ordinance that provides minimum standards to improve the availability of highly trained and diverse construction workers, as well as diverse and high role construction employers, who now in the future will be, a, will be available and able to perform infrastructure, commercial, residential, and industrial construction services to and in our city for generations to come in a manner that is e economically efficient and beneficial to the city, businesses, communities, support diverse and thriving families and individuals for the city. Board Bill 240 sponsored by Alderwoman Schweitzer, an ordinance recommended by the Board of Estim Estimate and Apportionment authorizing the Department of Utilities to accept grant ward awards from the Drinking Water State Revolving Funds administered through the Missouri Department of Natural Resources with funding from the American Rescue Plan Act containing an emergency clause. Board Bill 241 sponsored by Alderwoman Laura Keyes, an ordinance repealing ordinance number 70573 and Ordinance Number 71045 and establishing a new liquor control district within the boundaries of the 11th Ward, prohibiting the issuance of any packaged liquor or drink license for any current non-licensed premises and the transfer of any existing license to, to another premises within the area of the 11th Ward <coughs> in Section 2 for a period of five years beginning from the effective date of this ordinance, except as specified in Section 4 containing an emergency clause. That's the extent of first reading of board bills. If you could please send 241 to public safety. Reference to committee of board bills. I'm sorry, Madam President, you said 241 to public safety. I've already given 40. That's good. Okay, thank you. You're good. Refer yes, reference to committee. To the Health and Human Development Committee, Board Bill 229, 230, and 232. To Public Safety, Board Bill 231, 233, and 241. To Budget and Public Employee, Board Bill 234 and 235. To HUDs, 236. And to Public Infrastructure, Board Bill 237 and 238. And 240. I'm sorry, and 240. Thank you. Second reading and report of standing committees. The following board bills were reported out of transportation and commerce with the due pass recommendation. Board Bill 220 sponsored by Alderwoman Spencer and President Green and Alderman Aldridge. An ordinance recommended by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment authorizing $15,300,000 of interest funds earned on the city's funds received under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 and authorizing the transfer of such funds for the convention center project purposes, containing a severability clause and emergency clause. Board Bill 228, sponsored by Alderman Cohn, an ordinance recommended and approved by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, authorizing and directing the director of the airports and the comptroller of the city of St. Louis to enter and execute on behalf of the city an on airport passenger vehicle rental concession agreement with the concessionaires listed on Exhibit B containing a severability clause. The following board bills were reported out of Health and Human Development with a due pass recommendation. Board Bill 164, Committee Sub, sponsored by Alderman Cohn, Alderwoman Velasquez, and Alderwoman Sanye. An ordinance providing for the amendment of Ordinance Number 64401 as codified in Chapter 8.37 of the Revised Code of the City of St. Louis in order to extend the opportunity to register domestic partners in the Domestic Partnership Registry of the City of St. Louis to employees of the City of St. Louis who do not live within the city as well as, cities, as, well as city residents. Board Bill 226 as amended, sponsored by Alderwoman Sanye, an ordinance also known as Safe Temperatures and Rentals that provide a temperature performance standard to perfect to protect the health and safety of tenants from extreme temperatures contain the enforcement provision providing for penalties and a severability clause and an effective date. That's the extent of second reading report of standing committees. Report of special committees. We have none. 
Board bills for perfection consent. Board Bill 96 as amended, sponsored by Alderwoman Boyd and President Green, an ordinance creating the offense of unlawful discharge of a firearm when allowed under state and law. Clerk, if you could pause for one second, we have a request for to move some bills from second reading to perfection. Uh, Alderwoman from the 8th, you are recognized on the motion to suspend the rules for the purposes of moving Board Bill 220. Uh, to the regular perfection calendar. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we, uh, I make the motion that we move board bill to the perfection Second. calendar. It's been moved by the alderwoman from the eighth, seconded by the alderman from the third, that we suspend the rules for the purposes of moving board bill number 220 from the second reading to the uh, regular perfection calendar. This is a non-debatable motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer? No. Alderman Odenberg? Alderman Cohn? Alderman Orion? Aye. Alderman Balmer? Aye. Alderwoman Velasquez? Alderwoman Sanye? Aye. Alderwoman Spencer? Aye. Alderman Browning? Alderwoman Clark Hubbard? Alderwoman Keys? Aye. Alderwoman Tyus? Alderwoman Boyd? No. Thank you. Alderman Aldridge? President Green? Aye. Alderman Oldenburg? And all the, all the women ties was a no. That's 11 I votes and three, no, I'm sorry, 12 I votes and three no votes. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the alderwoman from the 8th. Madam Clerk, if you could please place board bill 220 at the end of the regular perfection calendar. So uh, Alderman from the 3rd, you are recognized on the suspension of the rules for the purposes of moving board bill... 228. 228 from second reading to the regular perfection or perfection consent calendar. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would like to move that we, or, uh, move that we suspend the rules for the purposes of moving Board Bill 228 from the second reading calendar to the perfection consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by the alderman from the third, seconded by the alderwoman from the tenth, that we suspend the rules for the purposes of moving Board Bill number two. 28 from second reading to uh, the regular, or sorry, the perfection consent calendar. This is a non-debatable motion. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderman Odenberg. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Alderman Orion. Aye. Alderman Balmer. Alderwoman Velasquez. Alderwoman Sanye. Aye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard? Aye. Alderwoman Keys? Aye. Alderwoman Tyus? Aye. Alderwoman Boy? Aye. Alderman Aldridge? President Green? Aye. 13 aye votes, one abstain and one voted present by your vote you sustain the motion from the alderman from the third to move board bill number 228 to the perfection consent calendar right. board bills for perfection consent board bill 96 as amended sponsored by alderwoman boyd and president green an ordinance creating the offense of unlawful discharge of a firearm when allowed under state law with penalty provisions. Board Bill 228 sponsored by Alderman Cohn, an ordinance recommended and approved by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, authorizing and directing the Director of the Airports and the Comptroller of the City of St. Louis to enter into and execute on behalf of the City on airport passenger vehicle rental concession agreement with concessionaires listed as Exhibit B containing a severability clause. That's the extent of Board Bills for Perfection Consent Calendar. Alderwoman from the 10th, you're recognized on the motion to adopt the board bills for the perfection consent calendar. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we adopt the board bills for perfection consent calendar. 
It's been moved by the alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the alderwoman from the 7th, that we adopt the board bills for the perfection consent calendar. Any discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th? I couldn't hear the ones that went to the perfection consent calendar. Um, could we repeat those? Uh, board Bill 96 as amended in 228. Please take Board Bill 228 off the perfection consent calendar and put it on the perfection calendar. Madam Clerk, if you could please make note of that. So noted. That it's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we adopt the board bills on the perfection consent calendar. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Board bills for perfection. Board Bill 44, committee sub as amended, sponsored by Alderman Aldridge. An ordinance pertaining to the permitting of surface parking lots as defined herein to be codified in section 8.70.010 and a new section 8.70.035 of the revised code of the City of St. Louis establishing additional requirements for the same containing a severability clause and an effective date. Alderman from the 14th, you are recognized on the perfection of board bill number 44, committee substitute as amended. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, I request we uh, move board bill 44 committee substitute as amended to the informal perfection informal calendar. Madam Clerk, if you could please move board bill 44 committee substitute as amended to the informal calendar. So noted. Board bill 80, well, I'm sorry, 180 committee sub sponsored by Alderwoman Sanye. Alderwoman Schweitzer and Alderman Browning. And ordinance repealing ordinance number 67914, 60202, and 70456, which established and amended the City Housing Conservation Program, acting in lieu thereof an ordinance that sets forth the procedures, requirements, fees, regulation, inspections, issuance, and revocation of certificates of inspection for dwelling units, adding rental dwelling unit registration, containing an effective date and a severability clause. Other woman from the seventh, you are recognized on the perfection of board bill one, any substitute. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to make the motion that we perfect board bill 180 committee substitute. It's been moved by the older woman from the seventh, seconded by the alderman from the ninth, that we perfect board bill number 180 committee substitute. Older woman, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Um, this rental registry creates a process in our city where eventually we will have a mandatory rental registry for our city. This is something that many other cities and areas have in place. This is something that the building division is really in support of. Um, and even though it may sound a little bit complicated, it really does three major things. Number one, the fines and fees that are um, under the building division right now, they have not been raised in over a decade. And so um, it does raise the fees by $30, and that will help to establish a technology fund for the building division. All of us work with the building division all the time. We know how critical, how important they are, how much capacity they will have, especially given the increased amount of legislation and ways we're trying to be more intentional about the living standards and the living places that our residents are living. And so they would like to have a technology fund to help them accommodate this increased responsibility and make up for staffing shortages. Um, this technology fund will also help them put the software in place that will help with the short-term regulation legislation that we passed as well as this. Uh, the second big thing that this legislation does is it puts the entire city of St. Louis under the housing conservation program. Um, most of the city is already under the housing conservation program with the exception of the 18th ward. But what that means when something is not under the housing conservation program is that the building vision does not have the authority to go and do inspections um, in that area of the city. And so they want to have the ability to do that there. And then the third thing that this uh, bill does is it will serve as, a, as an information collector. Uh, we do a lot of building of housing and units in the city of St. Louis. I know right now folks are talking about how we're increasing that by three times, but we need more data. How many ADA rental units do we have? How many two bedrooms or three bedrooms so that we can incentivize accordingly and find out you know, where that need is? So I really look forward to passing this bill and implementing it today. This is something that housing advocates have rooted for. This is something that the building division is 
rooting for that would really help them to increase their capacity and really has the benefit to increase the living standards for all of our residents. And we do know that over 50% of our city are residents. And also St. Louis Realtors are in support of this, as well as the Housing Coalition. So even, you know, those folks who operate large property owners are in support of this and understand how important it is and are looking forward to us having good community partnerships and more, you know, higher standard liver standards um, in our city. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th. Madam President, members of the uh, board, if the Alderwoman from the 7th would yield. The Alderwoman from the 7th yield to questioning from the Alderwoman from the 12th? Yes. Alderwoman, you may proceed. First of all, Alderwoman, there is no 18th ward. I would like to start out with that. I also would like to tell you that um, for many years, black wards in North St. Louis did not want to be part of the conservation district. In fact, when I came here in 91, I was the first ward to put all of the whole North St. Louis ward in a conservation district. And it was a big political hit because codes have been used and zoning issues have been used against people in North St. Louis and especially black people. And they've lost their houses and everything. So they're very, very, very distrustful of this situation. And I had to have 10 or 15 meetings across what was then called the 20th ward to have it um, and we took vote after vote after vote to convince them to be comfortable. They, the one thing that they were not comfortable with were the fees. The whole thing why we wanted a conservation district was because we wanted to keep inspections, which our, my, my ward was primarily homeowners, about 75, 80%. They own their houses, single family, a lot of single families, and some two families, and they wanted to keep their property values up. And so they were willing to pay for the inspections, which we don't get, by the way, anymore. Um, inspect they don't have enough inspectors to do what they're supposed to do. So um, we're paying money for inspections, and then we're not having anything but the people who apply new for um, inspections. They, they come out and they all uh, inspect the um, rental property that you have in the conservation district but they don't inspect the rest of it around, and you have to call and ask them, can you come out and do a door-to-door -door inspection? So where are we going to get um, these new people from? Because we don't have enough staff right now to do inspections. And we're going up, so now I want you to know that my people are complaining about having to pay this thing, these inspections, because maybe their property is good, but all around it, the building division is letting things go down so where are we going to get these new inspectors from to do these inspections? Did they tell you that? Thank you, Alderwoman Tyus. Um, I was aware that there are just 14 wards, but thank you for that reminder. Um, so in regards to the capacity, the building division, a part of why they really wanted this legislation is because they recognize the problem with them not being able to inspections the way that they do. They recognize that there's a large need for these inspections and they don't have the ability to need, need it. And so to that, I would point us to the point of establishing that technology fund. Um, that is how they're planning or hoping to be able to cover some of the gaps that they have of not meeting the needs in the city. Um, there is a fiscal note that's attached to the bill as well that outlines that the establishing the technology fund eventually will generate the city. It's estimated by year three at least $400,000 in increase from there. And so the building division is hoping to be able to use that increased revenue and be able to use technology because staffing is a struggle across all city departments. And so that's a huge part of the, how they're hoping to do this. In regards to your point about, you know, um, zoning codes and different things like that, uh, hurting people of color, hurting the North City, hurting black people, I certainly wouldn't I, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. I think that's very evident, and I know that our city is taking a look at those codes right now, and that's something that I support. But in regards to the housing conservation program, and you're talking about the connection to North City, the, the way that the building division is able to enforce the standards that we have on the books is those, is those inspections. So that, the previous, what was the 18th Ward, the fact that they are ineligible for inspections is hurting the building division's ability to enforce those standards there because the certificate of inspection, that is the process of how they do that. And so again, I would just say, I think many of your points I don't disagree with, and those are things that legislation hopes to, hopes to help to address and that those have been uplifted to me by the building division. Did you get, did you get elected in any part of what used to be the former 18th Ward? What would you say? Did you get elected in any part of what was the former 18th Ward? Were you elected to represent any part of what was the former 18th Ward? No, I can answer that for you. No, because you live in South St. Louis, so you do not have any part of it. The way that we got the conservation done 
is that we allowed each ward to decide for themselves what they wanted to do and why they wanted to do. I did get elected in part of what is the 18th ward, and I've served with who, the clerk who was the 18th ward alderman for a long time, and there were reasons why they didn't want. As I told you before, we had to very, very gently convince people that this was not be going to be forced down on their throat. But you walk in here and you decide this for the whole uh, city. And those people didn't want it. And I respected what the clerk had done as the 18th ward as I had conversations with them. I intend to come right back here when we pass this and take them out until they want to. Everybody else who was under the conservation district actually had a chance to decide for themselves. And I, as I told you, I believe in the conservation district, but I also believe in convincing people of what is in their best interest and not shoving things down their throat. So I resent that you will come in here and say, this is all good because the building division wanted, but the building division does not live in the former 18th Ward. They did not represent it. And by the way, the 18th Ward was very well represented and had some of the most buildings, new buildings and things done um, while I was down here. So. What they want is not necessarily what is in the best interest of the community. So I'm telling you right now, I'm voting against your bill because you should have did where the people wanted it and there should have been something to find out if that's what they wanted. Actually, the building division approached another alder person and I sent back and said, take my part out. Again, not because I don't believe in it, because I do believe in having conversations with people and making them know that they have a right to decide what's good for them. It's not what's in the best interest of the building division. It's in what's in the best interest of the community. So since you do not represent that part, if some, and, and I don't represent a great part and those who want it, okay, but since you do not, I resent you coming down here and saying, well, this is what the building division want over what the people want. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, do you mind? Can I just? No, you, I do not want to. I, I make you, a if you would like me to I'm making a statement. No, you do not have the floor to answer that. I'll tell you that. What I'm going to ask you about is um, this registry of properties. Okay. What is different about uh, the properties being identified than was different under the uh, conservation? Um, are you okay with me to speak now? I mean, for that question, I didn't make. I didn't ask you a question before. I made a statement. Okay, well, I'm going to respond to both your statement and your question. No, you're not. You're going to answer my Could question or you're not going to answer. Keep side conversations to the minimum so we can. Because you don't have the floor, I do. And it, you have it to yield to my questions, not my statements. Um, so, in regards to some of the things that you stated about. No, uh, so she doesn't want to answer my question. I'm done with her. I will just make my statements myself. Okay. You could have done that at the end, anything you wanted to, but I want to ask you questions. I don't want you to reply to my statements right now. Now, if you want to answer my questions, we're good. If, if you, you want to control every word, woman from the 12th I control the floor. the floor, not you. You just got here. Learn some things. Okay. You do not control the floor. If I say I don't want to ask you any more questions, you don't have a right to talk right now. Thank you. And I don't want to ask you any more questions. You don't want to answer my question. Alderwoman from the 12th, are you continuing to ask questions? If she wants to you... answer my questions, and that only if she wants to answer my questions. Uh, Alderwoman from the 7th, are you yielding for questions? I'm, I'm yielding for questions, Madam President, but we are all elected officials on the floor, and she made a I lot do of not. She doesn't know the rules. I don't have to we, do that, and I'm not doing I'm it. I'm going to, as long as it's okay for me to actually respond to anything that's said to me, I'm happy to respond. We, no, that is not what I asked her to so yield we, to. I asked her to uh, yield to questions, Alder not Woman, my statement. please, for one second, Alder woman from the seventh, um, answer the question from the alder woman from the twelfth, um, or don't. You don't have to yield for questioning, um, but we got to make sure only one person is talking at a time. Okay, so Th thank you very much. I will just point out the things that are incorrect in her bill. I don't need her to answer them. I was going to give her a chance to explain, um, but if she doesn't want to, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to talk about page 3 of 17, the Certificate of Inspection Requirements Exception. I could not find anything that was an exception in this thing. It says, it should be unlawful for a person. Alder woman from the 12th, if you could please speak into the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me better now? That is better. Okay. 
It shall be unlawful for any person, firm, partnership, corporation, or any other legal entity to occupy or permit the occupancy for any purpose or collect rent of any occupied dwelling unit when a complete change of occupancy has occurred without first securing a certificate of inspection for said dwelling unit. That's been in effect for, for, um, for a long time. I don't understand where the change is, and there's nothing to indicate where there's a change, because when I read the rest of it, it says you have to uh, apply for uh, 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 an inspection. It's unlawful for you to take possession as a result of conveyance without it being reflected in the Office of the Record of Deeds. Um, that's also, also something that already happens. I've been, not only did I put my ward in a conservation district, but I've been dealing with the conservation district for a lot of years because I have rental property, and not once in all these years that I've dealt with them have they, whether they knew it was me or somebody else, my units never passed inspection. So I'm trying to find out what is different that we would be going up on the fees other than we're going up on the fees. Um, it says that upon chain, undergoing a complete change of occupancy or sale of the property as reflected in the Record of Deeds Office with, without first obtaining a certificate of inspection, the code official shall serve written notice on the owner. They already do that. The certificate of inspection must be obtained within 30 day, calendar days of notification. They already do that. Okay. You have to send written notice, may be sent by personal service or prepaid. They already do that. It's the responsibility of the owner to secure a certif certificate of inspection. Um, they already do that. You have to provide access already. They already do that. Um, it says that you can't require them to, um, you can't require, require someone who is um, going to ask for a occupancy for them to um, pay for the fee. That is different. That must be the different. I wish you all would outline a, or somehow um, it is supposed to be so you can notice when you're changing something, there's supposed to be some kind of change. This is, it's bolded or something. They actually don't do this right now. Right now there are a lot of people who, um, and I've always thought that was unfair because uh, landlords are supposed to have their property ready to rent out. So this is a significant cha change that I actually agree with, which is that you should not have the, per the prospective renter pay for your occupancy permit. If you can't get your um, unit ready for occupancy, then you cannot and should not be required to ask them to pay for it. It says if there is a change of occupancy, or ownership within 12 months of the date of issuance of a certificate of inspection for the unit, a new certificate of inspection shall not be required. That is already the law. Much of this is copied. Excuse me, you do not have the floor. Please don't speak while I'm speaking. I told you I'm not recognizing you, and I kept the floor. So please don't talk over me. When it's your turn, you can talk. There. Can I just not sit? Um, I'm going to tell you right now. If the unit is available for inspection, the city shall inspect the unit within seven working days. That often does not happen. That is not time. There is not enough uh, inspectors. So you might have to work. And you actually can go online and you can um, make an appointment to get your inspections. But you can, you may or may not be able to um, get it within seven days. And that is not the person who owns the rental unit's fault. It is the, per the city doesn't have enough staff. With long-term rehabilitation work in progress with required building permits being issued, a portion of the building may be occupied if that person meets the requirement of, of Exhibit A and the exterior portion of the building is in compliance with the international property maintenance codes. I absolutely agree with this, except for the building division breaks it all of the time. They let people move into buildings and it's a mess on the outside. It is no way anybody should be. The stairs are broken, windows are broken. So again, I want to see you get this um, uh, done because it is not done now. It's already required, but they do not do it. So when they come in here and start talking about what they want, you ought to see how much they don't do. When you call them and say, how did you get this inspection, um, they're at a loss for words. 
because I have a, I take, tell anybody who wants to go to the corner of Dr. Martin Luther King and Pendleton and look at this little junk joint that has broken windows, uh, broken stairs. You wouldn't even want your worst enemy to be in it. And he has an occupancy food in there, and it is a mess. And I sent months ago to the building division, to the health department, to everybody saying, how is there an occupancy permit in this thing? But yet it is one, and it's a restaurant permit. And the reason why it, uh, I really found out about it, because this was somebody who wanted to now get liquor under the restaurant thing, which we're going to be talking about now, and he's going to probably get liquor, and he has no business even being open. So when you talk about what they should do, they don't do it. They don't do the laws that they're supposed to do right now. You're not going to have retro application to the certificates of inspection. What I want to say is part of the problem in the city of St. Louis, if you go to the county right now, if you want to look up who owns county property, if you have a name, you could put it in there and find all the property that they own. In the city of St. Louis, they cover up so you cannot find the problem property owners. You cannot put in salamas and then see a list of people who are wrong. When we're, that's all fine with the renters, but we need to have a problem property registry um, which when we have people who are doing things wrong, that that comes up. And we need to open up our entire assessor's database because there's no great secret to find out, to be able to look for people. When you got a problem property, if you already know it's Salamas, you should be able to put Salama in there and find all the property that um, they have. But you cannot. But you can go in the county and do that. That makes no sense at all except somebody um, provides for that to cover up and I've called the assessor on many occasions and asked why we don't have that open up. Why don't we have everybody be able to look up who to, where Sharon ties on property? But that is not available in the city, and it makes no sense. And I want to know, so if we now um, get this thing, put it back into the law again, that if uh, you can only get an occupancy if the outside and exterior is not correct, then what do we do? Because they don't do it. They do it anyway. So will we go and close it down? Who will look over the shoulder of the building division when they're not doing their job? When you issue a certificate of occupancy, and then clearly it has no business having a certificate of occupancy, then what happens from there? We make up these laws like we're doing something, um, but we're not doing anything, and it needs to be uh, a consequence when they're issuing things like that. And then it doesn't happen. They just are in there, and you write letters, and everybody says, oh, let me go out and check that. But I, I must have sent that letter at least five or six months ago. And to this day, the health department cannot tell me how he got past a health inspection. The building division cannot tell me how he got past a building division. And um, next week, I will bring all these um, I'll bring pictures of these things and, you, and put them on my desk like Alderman Moore used to do. And it's because it's in the former Fourth Ward. And how, how does this happen? This happened because we pass laws that we do not enforce. Um, I want to know why we are uh, providing that uh, you have to let somebody know that we're under an occupancy fit. When you purchase property, things like that ought to be your responsibility. You purchase the property, or we can require that it is, if it's recorded on the deed, you don't have to let them know because it's recorded on the deed. We already have the right of reinspection. Right now, when you're in the conservation district, you can do reinspection. In fact, part of the thing that we liked about the conservation district, as we talked about it, was that once you're in the conservation district and you're under that, then you have the right for building inspector to come out and with proper notice they can go inside. Before they always could do outside, but until the conservation district they could not do inside. So anybody who's saying the building division can't do outside, that's just plain wrong. I want to say I was here when there used to be a 10th ward, with now they, then they called the 20th ward, which is now called part of the 8th, I guess. Michael Sheehan, who was the alderman then of the 10th Ward, refused to do a conservation district. And some of his people wanted it, but he would not do it. 
and then he didn't run for reinspection because he was under, I mean, re-election because he was under so much heat that they wanted it. When people want something, they'll let you know. When people don't want something and you force it down their throats, they find a way not to do it. And we can look at busing, which um, did not work well because people tried to force busing upon people. And so people who didn't want it just took their children out of the school system. There's no way they're going to do a reinspection of rental units every three years. We're lucky in North St. Louis if we can get an inspection every four, five, or six years for interior inspection. They do not have the manpower. Anybody who told you they're going to do that is not telling the truth. They do not have the manpower to do it. When you do a reinspection, it's usually when there's a change of occupancy. And the other time is when you change um, the name on um, utilities. Then the owner gets a notice. Um, and we get it all the time because when our tenants leave, we have an automatic turn on that it goes back into our business name. And then the city sends us a notice and then we say, we're the owner. We just put it back in our name because we don't want the electric. We only put the electric on. We put the electric in our name so we can keep the lights on and the refrigerator. And if we need to do any cleanup or something like that. Um, it wastes a lot of time and money to me, but that already happens. You, um, so there's a notice for reinspection, and there's a notice for when um, utilities change already in effect. I'm looking here where it says that the code officials should have the authority to grant extensions for the completion of work necessary to correct deficiencies. If it is not feasible to complete such work to correct the deficiencies within 30 days from the date on which the notice was postmarked, notwithstanding the foregoing, if the code official determines that a dwelling unit or the building of which a unit is located is condemnable pursuant to the provisions of this chapter or any other ordinance, the code official shall have authority to condemn such units or buildings pursuant to the uh, provisions of this code. I have seen so many buildings where they may have one person living in it, and the rest of the building looks like it's falling down. I don't see how you let one unit stay open if the rest of the unit is falling down and should be condemned. Um, the city's going to get sued sooner or later about this. If it's that bad that you want to condemn it, then nobody should be allowed to stay in there. Somebody should be, we should be, have provisions for that person to be moved to a safe place. On page 11 of 17, I already talked about that. We already have notice when change of utility. That is already in effect right now. And I really don't understand why we have such love of renters but not homeowners. We want everybody to know that the renters have a safe place to be, but we don't care about taking away all the rights of homeowners and people who pay the taxes here. We're not going to have any homeowners left in the city of St. Louis, especially not black middle class. The reports keep coming out that black middle class are leaving at a rate of 29 persons or family a month from this city of St. Louis. I represent many black middle class homeowners, and they don't like the things that they see down here, and they don't like the push to make everything citywide. Your proposed solutions or our horror stories. They are not in the best interest of my community. It's what you want to do in and, and, and places that you would never get elected. Most of you all would never get elected it's talking this kind of stuff to the black middle class homeowners that live in North St. Louis. They don't want it. And they spoke very loudly on who they continue to elect because they don't want it. They want people who live in the community to help make them make good decisions, not you push stuff down people's throat. We talk about having, um, I look at page 14 of 17, reporting by code officials. Three years after the effective date of this ordinance, the Board of Aldermen may, by majority vote, request a report prepared by the code official. The charter already requires yearly that every department report to the Board of Aldermen. In fact, I'm just writing a letter right now saying, where are your reports? They're supposed to do that already. They don't do it, and nobody does anything about it. But the charter does require it. We should sometimes read our charter. 
I like that the building division is having an information technology fund, but if they have it and then we have to ask for it and they're not giving it to us, that doesn't make any sense to me. They should be required to give any kind of report to us yearly, not two, three, four years down the line. See, you have an emergency clause in here. There's no emergency. There's no emergency for what somebody wants at the expense of what the people who own their houses want. I have never seen such a group of people who talk about citizens' participation that hold off spending all kinds of money year after year after year after year, or, and, and especially this ARPA money and this RAM money and talk about future and talk about, but we're going to put it out online for people to vote for what they want but then do not believe that the rest of the city has a right to decide what they want. It is a conflict to me. You either believe in citizens' participation or you don't. You cannot have it both ways when they don't agree with what you say. Citizens get to participate and they get to disagree with you. I, again, believe in the Conservation District. I want it to be better. I've complained about it for the last couple of years because it's not better, it's worse. All of these things that you're putting in place that you're protecting the renters, renters are not going to have any place to rent if the homeowners don't have good places to live. If we don't get good inspections all over the city, if we don't make sure the rules and regulations are uh, enforced all over the city, we're not going to have a city. We're continuing to lose population. We're under 300,000 people. You think this is going to help. It might help the constituency you want, but it does not help the constituency that I represent. Again, I am going to vote no because you decided that it was in the best interest of some people who did not want to have it for whatever reason. And that's what we told them, that we would never force anybody to have conservation district that did not want it. But new people come down here and they say to damn, to hell, with whatever was said to the people. They don't know what they're doing half of the time. They do not represent the community. They think what their community is more important than what other communities want. And it is not. And this is not going to work the way you say, because there's one thing to pass rules, but there's another to actually own property and see how it works. And this is not going to work in the way that you think it will. Parts of it are good. A great deal of it is um, already in place. And the parts where you say, well, we're going to put everything in there because the building division wants it, not what the rest of the community wants, is a mistake. And that's what we did with everybody else, is we let them make their own decisions. So this is a mistake to push this down their throats. And it's not because of what I believe, because I've already had, been having conversations with them but my conversations was to tell them why this would be a good idea, not to say I'm going to try to pass it anyway. So my vote will be for my part of the community that you did not get their consent. And I've been talking to some of the other people about how do you all believe in protests and having citizens have every, their right, and then you don't, and then you pass laws to the extreme opposite. I'll be ashamed of yourself. You don't know what's good for the former 18th Ward, and I doubt very much very, that you could get elected in the former 18th. Any further discussion? Alderman from the third. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks brief. I, this is a, a bill that there's been very lengthy discussion on, uh, both inside and outside of committee hearings. Um, I, in fact, had probably about an hour and a half long conversation with the sponsor and the building commissioner uh, several weeks ago at this point in time. But, um, you know, in those conversations, I think, you know, what I've tried to reiterate is that, you know, I do support expansion of the housing conservation districts. I do support, uh, you know, even increasing the fee um, for building department because we haven't done so in 12 years, um, you know, and I do support uh, a registry for out-of-town owners of property. It's a huge problem. And in fact, we have legislation on the books already that requires that there's a local agent for properties that are owned by people outside of the city. 
Um, you know, we continually talk about wanting quality housing here in the city of St. Louis, and it is a huge challenge for us to be able to provide that. Housing itself is not a challenge. We've got an abundant amount of vacant properties throughout the city of St. Louis. Uh, go to any neighborhood in North St. Louis or even Southeast City, the area I represent, some blocks are 30% vacant. In North St. Louis, it's higher. So we've got an abundancy of housing. What we don't have is quality housing. And what we don't have, by the admission of the building commissioner himself during the committee hearing, is building inspectors to do the work to ensure that we are citing and fining owners of property that are derelict, that are falling into decay, that have building code violations. During that committee hearing, it was publicly stated that the city of St. Louis is only inspecting properties if they're getting a permit or if there's a complaint. There is no proactive inspection process happening in the city of St. Louis to ensure that building code violations are not happening on our blocks. That is a huge issue and it's a detriment to quality housing, period. This bill won't solve that issue, which is something I really struggle with. Um, I know the sponsor has her heart in the right place. I know she's worked very hard on this bill as well. Um, I've been part of those conversations. But many of those things, <clears throat> without direct funding to our building division, are not going to become reality. The city of Cleveland actually went through a similar process as what we're going through now um, in terms of trying to address vacancy, in terms of trying to address quality housing, affordable housing, and other programs that have been discussed here at the Board of Aldermen. One of the things that I really appreciated about their background is that they actually had data to support some of the decisions that were being made. They had inspectors actually go around the city for years and evaluate the quality of the housing. They didn't have to go inside to even judge that. You can look on the exterior of a building, the commissioner said this plainly during the committee hearing, to determine whether or not a building is being looked after. My block alone, I have houses that are currently occupied that have fascia boards missing, gutters missing, when you have a gutter missing, where do you think that water goes? That water goes right down the side of the building. And when it's going right down the side of the building, it's getting absorbed by that beautiful brick and mortar. And it's causing plaster on the inside to bubble up. That plaster on the inside starts to bubble up. It doesn't get maintained as quickly as it can. It's expensive to maintain, very expensive to maintain. And then mold, after prolonged experience you know, of moisture, buildings get mold. So that gutter that's missing, it might sound like a minor infraction, but it becomes a huge issue for the quality of housing in this city. That fascia board that's missing that holds the gutter, that's a huge issue for quality housing in this city. I have... AC units that were improperly installed and blocking fire access to properties. They're blocking walkways. They're blocking gangways. They're not getting proper ventilation. You know what happens when an AC unit is inappropriately installed somewhere? Well, if there's a fire in the building, the fire department can't get inside the building and people die. But at minimum, if it doesn't have the proper ventilation, what ends up happening? That AC unit can develop mold and also start to transport critters who like to habitate inside of them into the building itself as well. It becomes a, run a runway for roaches and rats and rodents if it's not appropriately installed. I have garages 
that are completely falling down. Completely falling down. I have tuck pointing that's not addressed. I already you know, talked a little bit about that. Recently, I had someone who just created their own driveway, just poured a bunch of gravel in their front yard. No permits, no curb cut, just poured a bunch of gravel in the yard. Hop in the curb, driving over the sidewalk, parking on the sidewalk. None of that is enforced by our building division. None of it. I have a whole list here. I can go on and on and on. This is just my block that I live on. The building department is not addressing those concerns proactively. I put in a complaint and have on some of them, and my neighbors have as well. And then where do those complaints go? Sometimes they're looked into, sometimes they're not. Sometimes when they are looked into, they eventually end up going to housing court, which is another issue that we're not addressing in this legislation. Housing court is a joke. It is an absolute joke. We spend years and years and years documenting issues of decay of our housing stock in the city of St. Louis to finally get it referred over to housing court. And then housing court slaps someone on the wrist with a fine of $50 or maybe $500 if lucky for that property to continue to decay whether that's a small-time investor, a homeowner, or Paul McKee. It's shameful what happens with housing court. Again, not addressed in this legislation. The legislation, at least on its summary, says that this is a mandatory rental registry. What makes it mandatory? If there is an apartment that's currently owned Utility bills are paid for by the landlord. It will never see the light of day again. There's absolutely nothing mandatory about it. Absolute, and in fact, could drive more people to act in that manner so that those properties aren't put on a public registry, that they don't come up for reinspection. So this could actually have some unintended consequences that make our housing stock even worse. I'm glad that the sponsor added a three-year inspection. That wasn't initially in there. Uh, I brought that up during the committee hearing. However, you need, in order for that to happen, you need every property in this city to go through an inspection process. Now, we don't know right now whether or not a property is owner-occupied or a rental property. So in order for that to be an effective tool, we would literally need to create a baseline and have every property inspected, determine whether or not it's vacant, whether or not it's occupied, if it is occupied, is it owner-occupied, is it rental, what is it? If we don't do that, then people can just keep fooling around and doing the same thing that they've been doing for decades. One of the things that I brought up during the committee hearing was that we increased fees 12 years ago. You know, we should be increasing them a little bit more regularly than every decade plus. But when it was passed, 60% was supposed to go to lead remediation. I'm bringing this up time, as many times as I have to because I think it is absolutely appalling. I was here when we passed that increase. I remember the sponsors of the bill passionately speaking about the need for lead remediation in our city, particularly in places like Southeast City and North St. Louis and basically east of Grand, every place east of Grand and probably north of Page has some level of lead exposure through paint or other products in the house. That fee increase that was made 12 years ago, 60%, 60% was supposed to go towards lead remediation efforts. During our committee hearing, it was disclosed that that fee is now used for funding of building department staff. 
they use the excuse that those inspectors are doing lead remediation work by virtue of their inspections. That is false. Remediation, by its very definition, means removal and fixing the issue. Inspecting the issue to death doesn't fix the issue. 60% of that increase was supposed to go help our kids that live in substandard housing. It's not happening. How can we trust that the 10% of this fee increase is going to go into the IT infrastructure fund that's in here? We're not even enforcing the 60% that's supposed to be directly helping our kids. And our seniors, who are most vulnerable to lead poisoning, I have been down here, yes, seniors are also very vulnerable to lead poisoning. Seniors and children. I think at the end of the day, if we don't fix the root cause of this issue, which is staffing in our building division, it doesn't matter how much IT we have, if there is not someone on the ground going in and inspecting the property, a computer doesn't mean anything. We can have all the iPads in the world sitting in you know, the third floor waiting for someone to come and pick it up and take it out to Dutchtown, the hill, Penrose Park. If we don't have the people doing the work, the IT doesn't matter. If we don't have people out in our neighborhoods and our communities ensuring and holding people accountable for the properties that they own, we're going to continue to see a decrease in the real estate tax, which we continue to see time and time again. I spend countless hours down here talking about incentive reform and how incentive reform is needed because it's robbing money from our schools. Well, guess what else is robbing money from our schools? The devaluation of property in the city of St. Louis. Tenfold, more than any of the incentive projects that have ever, ever happened down here. Because every single year, the property in this city continues to decline in its quality, except in certain communities. But in areas where vacancy continues to be an issue, and in some cases continues to rise, we have no inspectors holding people to account for the property that they bought at tax sale, or the property that they bought out of foreclosure, or even the property that they might have hold on to for 30 years and are trying to survive in a neighborhood where they're having to put every single diamond dollar they have into a property while their neighbors are not being held accountable for the decline and decay of the properties that literally surround these individuals who are owning these properties. So until we actually start talking about fully funding the building division, initiatives like this mean nothing. By the testimony of the building commissioner himself, it means nothing. We did this 12 years ago. We passed a registry for out-of-town owners. They're supposed to be doing that now. They're not doing it. We did increase the fee so that we can do lead remediation. We're not doing it now. Housing conservation inspections, they're not happening the way they should. They are happening, but they're not happening the way they should. When someone takes out a permit, and this is another issue I have with the bill, you go down and you can simply say, you know, I need an occupancy permit. You don't have to tell them. There's nothing, you know, that requires anyone to say what you are getting the occupancy permit for, except whether or not it's commercial or residential. And at the end of the day, 
The inspector comes out, they do a walkthrough. How attentive they are to detail can be questionable depending upon the inspector. The inspector then, if they find violations, will send out a letter saying, you know, thank you for your time, I inspect, I'm being courteous here, it doesn't always say those types of things, but, you know, essentially, here are the violations we found on the property, these need to be remediated within 30 days before an inspection for, or a certificate of an occupancy can be issued. The building inspectors are accepting photos as follow-up. They don't go back and actually look at the property again. So someone can, one of the violations, no railing on front stoop. Someone can literally go right next door, take a photo of an identical building with a railing on their front stoop, email that to the inspector, and say, voila, I, I installed a you know, railing on the front stoop. Or fire detector missing, that's a pretty common one. Most landlords, in particular, paint their units the same color. They get the same color paint for every unit. So if there's a fire detector that's missing, they can just go into one of their other units, take a picture of the fire detector, email it, voila, certificate of inspection issued. An iPad isn't going to fix that. These are issues that need to be addressed and they can only be addressed through adequate funding of our building division. The building commissioner spoke about how staffing has been an issue. It's an issue for many city departments. We need action from our personnel department to work on classification and compensation for roles in the city departments, period. We need it for the building division, we need it for the health department, we need it for every city department. And until we start solving those types of issues, bills like this are not going to have the impact that we hope that they would have. Again, I support housing conservation districts. I support the expansion of them. I commend the alderwoman for you know, adding that into this bill. You know, I support quality housing. I think very passionately, as many people down here can attest to, I want this city to work for its residents. And I, I hope that this bill has the intention that you desire, Alderwoman. I don't think that it will for the reasons that I've spelled out already. Um, you know, maybe this is one of those, we'll do it, see how it works, it'll make things better. But I think I'll, you know, probably be talking to my neighbors about these same issues down the, down the road. And uh, that's very frustrating for me. So, you know, I, uh, I voted present in the committee hearing because I do believe with the intent of this bill, but I'm still very concerned in questioning the effectiveness that this will have in terms of holding people accountable, maintaining any type of transparency with respect to our building code and violations and things of that nature. And God, I hope that the city actually spends the money on what they say they're gonna spend the money on because they haven't done it in the last 12 years since we last increased the building fees. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 13th. Uh, yes, Madam President, would Alderwoman from the seven take a question? Would the Alderwoman from the 7th yield to questioning from the Alderwoman from the 13th? Yes. Alderwoman, you may proceed. So what I'm hearing is we already have this legislation in place. Did you ever think to just amend what we already had? 
much of this legislation is copy and pasted from the code that is already in place. The big changes are the things that I mentioned. So much of the, the practices and policies already in place are actually in this in this bill. Um, the parts that are new are the the big parts that I mentioned. So I did you know do thorough work um, with the building division, um, with our city councilor's office, and made sure that we were kind of uh, addressing ordinances. Okay, so again the. the I agree with what my colleagues were saying because both of them have were been here before me. But when you live in a community that deals with this, and Alderman Cone hit it right on the head, when you have a housing court that's dysfunctional, when you have building inspectors that are not get putting occupancy permits on properties or they're giving them occupancy permits for property that are falling down where our hands are tied. And so I think it sounds like a good idea, but it's not because it's too many holes that's going to impact our city. And so parts of South St. Louis and North St. Louis are going to be penalized or hurt again. We're not going to win this battle. And that's why I asked, why wouldn't you just amend what was there? in the original housing conservation because Greg Carter and Sharon Tyus was a part of that original piece. And so it was working great. And then we start losing building inspectors. And so now you feel that technology is going to help. It's not going to help because they're not going to be inspecting the property. So we're going to be right back in the same situation. So nine times out of ten, it was the seniors that were impacted. But now we have an issue where not only we have the, uh, the lead uh, in the buildings, but now we have mold in the building. And so now we're adding to the health issues that are in these old buildings. So that's why I asked, why wouldn't you just amend what we already have on the books. Because to me, this is just repeating what was already there. And all the woman Tyus brought that to reality and said, we already have this in place. Yes, Alderman Boyd, this doesn't, I'm not adding a new housing conservation program. This is a housing conservation program that's in existence. It's just expanding it. So I'm not adding, um, I'm not changing any practices of the housing conservation program. This bill would just make it so that the entire city is under the housing conservation program. So this does, you, you're saying why didn't you amend it? I, this is just expanding it. I'm not changing it at all. This is the current practices that are in place, which is why much of those things that were listed previously were things that are in the housing conservation program because I'm not recreating it or making it different. I'm just, this bill just expands it. And again, I know you're saying it doesn't help, but um, last week we all clapped for Frank Oswald and he told me himself as well as many people in their department we worked for months on this legislation they want the things in this legislation they want the things in this bill they think that it will help them and so I don't disagree with any of the many of the points that have been raised today um, I, I am acknowledgement and aware of these issues and they've come up many times but if the building division is and this will help us move in the right direction then that you know that's the intent of this bill certainly we won't capture everything or solve every problem with one piece of legislation, but I have worked with the building division and the city councilor on this bill for months, and they have asked for the things in this bill, and much of it is not new. It's expanding what's already in place. The components are new are the areas that I listed when I first gave my opening for the bill. And that's fine, but as Alderman Cohn said, it never happened in the first place. So we're blowing smoke up in the air because it never happened. So when they, do the, when they do the citation, when they send them to housing court, because I was one of those all the people that went to housing court looking for those landlords, and they never even brought the cases to court. So I guess my question is, why aren't we looking at the systems that are in place to ensure that those systems are working to protect the people that have these properties? And I, I, need, I uh, yield. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th. Madam President, members of the board. Um, first, I want to say um, I wasn't the original um, person who did 
Cons Conservation District because it was already here when I came in 91. But every in, in the 16th Ward had it, the 23rd Ward had it, the 24th Ward had it, the 28th Ward, 7th, 6th, most of South St. Louis except for the 10th, which is, then became the new 20th, um, no North St. Louis wards had it. So when I came in 91 and 92, after working really hard, I got my community to vote that that's what they wanted. And then the 27th ward got it, the 21st ward got it, the third ward got it, um, and many wards after that followed, except for the, the alderman from the 18th, and his wisdom, and he had been here before all of us, did not do it. And the alderman of the 18th is now our clerk. And he did not do it for the reasons that we had suggested we are, that I already said, that each ward were able to decide if they wanted to, inst to uh, put the conservation district in effect because, again, in black communities, zoning codes and all kind of building inspections has been used against them, even to the point of restrictive covenants. I live on a street that has a restrictive covenant when I moved there said black people couldn't live there. We, I now represent the house that's very, very, very famous, Shelly V. Kramer, which allowed black people to move across a certain line. In the city of St. Louis, over and over and over, they have had these lines in which black people couldn't move. What people don't know is they also had those lines for Jewish people. Um, when you look at the, nobody knows and understands about the Chase Park Plaza. There are two different hotels because one part wouldn't let Jewish people in it. So Jewish people said, let me show you something, and built a taller building. Okay? There's been all kind of restrictive covenants and zoning. So black people did not believe in it. Let me tell you, I, I'm the first, but I don't believe in the conservation district anymore because it was supposed to be a supplement to already good building inspections. And so before they tore my ward up, we didn't have vacancies. We, we, they would always compare the 16th ward and the 20th ward. We didn't have all those vacancies. We didn't have uh, raggedy houses. The ones we did, I could get tore down pretty fast and they were gone. So the whole thing with Conservation District was to be a supplement to exterior um, inspections so that you would then have things inside because people would fix up the outside of the houses and then they would uh, lease, rent, or sell to people, and the interior was horrible. And so it was to get at the interior, which we all agreed that was a good idea. But what I don't like is that we're having these people pay these fees, and you're not doing the original job of a building inspector, which is to inspect the community. I have my community asking, when are we going to go back to doing door-to-door -door inspections again? We, I used to do one, one part of my ward every year. Some or one or two parts of my ward would get door-to-door -door inspections. And at first, people got really irritated about that. But once they understood that, they understood that getting a uh, door-to-door -door inspection saying, hey, paint your uh, fascia boards or fix your gutter was better than letting the, the fascia board fall down or letting the gutters come off. And then you have... Uh, a mess and it cost a lot more money. Um, and right before we went into the conservation district, um, one of the first black judges in the city of St. Louis lived in my ward and he had not had proper porch maintenance. And just to make that point, right before we got the conservation district, his um, whole front porch roof fell down. And he had been one of the people that was kind of an opponent. And he called me up and said, okay, Alderwoman, you didn't have to send me that message. I wasn't in charge of that message, but the message has always been, don't fix the broken window. Don't let the house become a nuisance house or a house that's not inspected. So we're not getting proper inspections. We now say that they have to inspect every three years as a rental property because this is, we're promoting this is the uh, year of the renters. No, it isn't because they're not going to do it every three years because they don't have the wherewithal. And if they do it for the renters, so that means that if you rent a piece of property, at one address, but right next door is a home-occupied property, you will be inspecting the rental property, but not the property next door. That makes no sense. All of the properties need to be inspected on the outside and taken and keeping in a, a, a like manner of, of respectability and a place where uh, people want to live. 
and that you should be following the building division rules. You could cut your grass, you pick up your trash, paint your face, your boards. A lot of St. Louis is brick, so you, you have to do tuck pointing a lot of times. Those are all the things you have to do. The alderman from the third talked about how he was really a proponent of uh, housing. I have been one since the 70s. I, I always tell you all, any of you all want to come to my apartment buildings, you're free to just call me up and say, hey, Sharon, I want to, I'll take you to them. I put a lot of pride in owning habitable property. And I'm very proud because I have tenants that have been my tenants for 12, 13, 14 years because if, I can't get in, if we can't get anything fixed the first time, we go buy new ones. I do know there are a lot of bad landlords. But this thing of pushing, we're going to make it for the renters at the expense of homeowners is a foolish proposition. You should be doing all kinds of inspection. And if you're going to charge extra fees, then the fees um, should make sure that everything and everybody is getting inspected. If it's not, it doesn't make any sense. If you have all rental property, what you're going to have is portions of my ward that had all rental property, I'm tearing it all down now. Because when the landlords get tired of it, they can't keep it up or don't want to put any money in it, they let it go. And then all kind of things happen. Um, in, uh, indigent people or people who are, uh, uh, doesn't have shelter, they have come into one street particularly, and we've tore down half of the houses, then there were four families on there. This push of renters at the expense of homeowners, at some point property owners have to be considered. And pushing this to be some great savior of renters is just not going to happen. And then add on to it, you've taken away one of our rights. You say, well, they can give us a, a report every three years. Right now, under the St. Louis City Charter, we're supposed to get a report every year. We're supposed to get a report from every division. I was waiting for the alderman from the third to come back because I was wondering if he would yield. <laughs> Sorry about that, Alderwoman. Yes, no, I, no, no, I will no. yield for questioning. And sit if you need to, because you can just bring Alderman from the third, will you yield to questioning from the Alderwoman from the 12th? Thank you, Madam President. Yes, I will yield to questioning. Alderwoman, Alderwoman I, you may proceed. Thank you. Since I came back here, I've talked about how many times about, you've heard me talk over and over about, we have a right under the charter to, to get us a, a yearly report. Correct. Are you aware of that right? Yes. So why would we be... Explain to me, why would we then say we can get a report every three years when right now we have a right to get a yearly report? Uh, so I'm not sure that that's what the legislation does. I think the, the three-year requirement is actually for re-inspection. It's not necessarily for the reporting out of the program. Okay. But it's been a minute since I've looked at the finer print in the bill. So. Okay, so it does say that, but I'll get it out. But So right now we have a right to um, every year for a report. I don't recall the last time I got a report from the building division. Or any other department? <laughs> Some of the departments. I've, I, I've received uh, reports from the personnel department, from the fire department, from the health department, and a few other departments, but largely, no. Okay. But we have that right. Correct. And so um, if they don't do it, does anything happen to them? Not so far in my years down here at the Board of Aldermen. Okay, so if we put whatever right... Oh, and I'm sorry, I should add the airport and the water division price... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. What happened? The airport and the uh, water division, which are both enterprise accounts, they have delivered annual reports. Ex exactly. Uh, the water, I don't think every year, but many years they do it. And the airport, I think, does it pretty much every year. Correct. There are so many departments that you don't get anything from. Now, they might give a little report if you sit on... Um, ways and means of the budget, they might come and get somewhat report. It's usually because they want their budget is before and they have to do some things, but they don't give um, a yearly report. So let me ask you, um, in your years as an alderman, how often do you get door-to-door -door inspections in your different neighborhoods? Recently? Mm -hmm. None. I beg your pardon? None. You don't? No. So. What was your, so my understanding of a conservation district was this is going to be a tool with the rest of the board of all, I mean, of the rest of the building division. So we would have the building division doing inspections and citing people with small infractions before they got to be large infractions. And then 
that would prevent our neighborhoods from going down. Is that your understanding or maybe so I that, My understanding is the housing conservation districts uh, allow the city to do occupancy inspections to code violations that would happen. So anytime there's an occupancy permit that's issued, they would require an occupancy inspection to be done. And so that's the kind of genesis of the housing conservation districts, whereas prior it was just code violations, which predominantly on the outside of the property. But it also in, in allows the city to go in. Before we had the housing conservation, we did not have, except for if it was uh, certain, certain exceptions, we didn't have the right to go into housing. Correct. And so right now, I put in my housing conservation, I told you, in 1992, people such as myself, guess what? We were already in our houses. We don't have a right. And still, this law won't give anybody a right to go into the houses because you're already in it, right? So that will only be for people who are new and moving in and out. Is that correct? Yeah, it, the reinspection only applies to those that are part of the rental registry. And as I mentioned in my testimony, I think that that is uh, not a fail-proof situation because there are going to be landlords that aren't on the registry that are going to continue to, uh, you know, be off the grid, so to speak. And then. Uh, with respect to homeowners, uh, this would not require any reinspection of their property, period. I don't know. Did you see recently about um, just what you talked about in the news about some people who were, because that was one of the things we talked about as we were doing housing conservation districts and bringing them on board, that if people just left it in the landlord's name, you really don't come up for review. Is that correct? They, the building commissioner testified as much at the hearing uh, when this was before the HUDS committee. Okay, and did the building inspector testify about, you said something about when he came to testify, how many building inspectors he has now? Did he talk about that? I, 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 don't, I don't recall, Alderwoman. I, I probably asked that question, um, but, you know, the standard response that's come back over the years whenever I do ask that question is generally that they... You know, they're short-staffed, but every department is short-staffed. And, uh, you know, I've never recall a specific number by which there's a deficit. But what I do know is when I first got elected, they were doing uh, inspections of each ward. At the time, it was 28 wards, and they were doing a third of each ward every year. So in theory, you know, every three years, the entire city would have been inspected. And what the commissioner shared with us during the hearing is that that no, that no longer happens, period. Right. Did he give an a, a example of how often it happens now? Uh, he said it is not happening at all. The only time the building inspectors are uh, issuing cite citations is upon complaints about the property or when they're told for the property. So Again, that means that just blows my mind. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So that means mostly most of the city housing um, stock does not get inspected anymore. Unless Absolutely there's a right. egregious problem and somebody asks for it. But we just don't have the staff. So did the inspector tell us, since this is their request, where we're going to get the staff from for these new inspections? They did not. Okay. So... And I will say, I use, because every time we have an uh, empty thing, if it's less than a year, and we never have empties, uh, apartments that are uh, less than a year, I call, I make sure we get our inspection. You can go online. I don't know if you use that, but you actually can go online and book your appointment. Um, and they come out, but they never do. It's usually weeks in, that you have to wait for that because they don't have enough staff. So... Um, how are we going to enforce some of these requirements? That's what I want to know, if you don't have the staff to do it. I am uh, very much questioning the same older woman. The last time I uh, applied for an occupant inspection, I believe it took three weeks uh, for an inspector to come out to the property to inspect it. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my own testimony at that point in time, you know, photos are required, you know, or uh, are not required, but you can simply send in a photo addressing the citations that are there, which you know, I don't think is an effective tool for enforcement, period. Well, you just made a prime example. When you, I laughed when you said that most owners paint their units the same color. You do because you have to buy paint in a big, large stock. So off-white, shell-white, 
It's a very good uh, thing to purchase because you go in there and you paint all your units that color, um, and it's easier so you don't have to try to go back and rematch things. So you're absolutely right. If you have a unit, all four units look alike. If they're, I didn't, so I'm kind of shocked that they accept a picture. You just told me something that I didn't know. Because if, you can, if I can submit a picture, I can go into most of my units in one building, and they all look alike. <laughs> and, and say, here, I've put this up and not done anything. We usually, so um, we usually call them and tell them to come back out, and they'll say, well, we're going to come back when we can. Um, but we're passing this with the condition that you do this, and then they will come by. by. And I kind of insist on that since I'm on the board of aldermen. I don't want anybody to say that I'm getting by with something, so I'm kind of insistent. I didn't know that they, I, I would never let them do a picture with, with my property because um, I'm proud that I do keep it in the way it's supposed to, and I wish all landlords would, would do that. Alderman, if I may, I would recommend the shade Agreeable Gray. It's a border <laughs> between gray and beige, and it's quite lovely. Well, thank you for that recommendation, but we've been, we've been doing boring shell <laughs> white for a long time. It works, <laughs> and people can put their own color by putting their, uh, uh, their curtains and furniture in there. And when they leave, no matter when they leave, we go back and paint the whole apartment, and it's easy that way because it matches up and you don't have streaks. So I appreciate that. The next person who takes over our buildings, they can bring it up to date. But uh, we're not going to change that color now. And we buy that paint by the gallons. Um, so you said you uh, support uh, the expansion of conservation districts. I but do. you just heard me say there's not one ward, even though we have bigger wards, there's nobody here that the people didn't decide where and whether they wanted to have a conservation district. And I'm saying even when Michael Shin of the 10th Ward wouldn't do it, then he didn't run again, and then Craig Schmidt came in and did the conservation district. So knowing our clerk, do you believe that perhaps there was a reason he didn't do the 18th Ward? Yeah, actually, uh, when we went through this process 12 years ago with the increase in the fee, which was to go towards lead remediation, um, the initial bill that was submitted did expand the housing conservation districts to include all of the city of St. Louis. Uh, there was a floor substitute that was a, uh, produced, and the floor substitute addressed uh, you know, the removal of the then 18th ward, the former 18th ward, from the housing conservation program, which the now clerk you know, explained uh, at length the history around the program and some of the concerns there. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the increase that happened, you know, never went towards lead remediation efforts. It's sitting in a trust fund, but it is used for the purposes of staffing and inspections. And, and I heard you talk about the fees, okay, which you uh, said you support. But why would we, why would you support fees when you clearly told us they don't spend them the way they're supposed to be spent? So... Why are we increasing fees and we're not, what are we getting more from this? Okay, if we don't have enough people and they're letting people take pictures. Now, I was much more for this except for the part about putting in my part of the ward that they didn't ask for. But the more I hear about it, I'm kind of like, why would we increase fees if we can't hire enough people? And we're not getting the services that we're supposed to. So can you explain that to me, please? I, so I, in theory, agree with increasing the fee when, you know, there are programs or, you know, situations in place where we need to either address staffing level or, in this case, you know, also provide additional technology or a fund that's specific to the building division, uh, you know. But again, I'm voting present on the bill because I have, con you know, concerns around whether or not in practice that's actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'll be voting present on this because I, I, don't, I don't think that this is going to be enacted the way that it's intended. And your ward has been under conservation district. You, you, took, you have much of the old 25th? The old 25th, correct. So that was, that was a ward that was also Paul Becker, Beckerly represented when it, I came here. And that's so correct. That was, so that's been there 35 years or so? Yeah, because mine has been 33. <laughs> but I'm just saying, so can you tell me? So like I said, I was a big push. Impressed. Oh, we should have a conservation district. Can you tell me how that's been um, something that has been effective? 
um, on the exterior. I believe in the interior, it's a good tool. It's something that you get it, and that's what it was for. But how has it helped you with the exterior of your building? And do you think that's a good thing to have an interior of a building okay, but falling down on the outside? I guess that's my question. Alderwoman, I think, uh, one, you know, it, it hasn't been you know, that successful. I, I literally have buildings in the new third ward and also in the old 25th ward that are literally falling down. In fact, one of the buildings that uh, was in the old 25th ward recently made the news. It was a, you know, four or five story building on South Grand right at the corner of Grand and Alberta. The whole rear wall collapsed into an alleyway and onto the street. Um, so roughly, you know, about a quarter of the building, maybe a third of the building, entirely collapsed. That was not uh, unforeseeable. There were tuck pointing issues, there were gutter issues, there were bricks that had been falling out of the rear of the building for years, years. And I can guarantee that that building was never even remotely taken into housing court. Particularly on vacant buildings in the city of St. Louis, vacant buildings, Having regular inspections of vacant buildings is not happening. We're not addressing the quality of those buildings at all. And we're not taking them to housing court in the manner that we should. And that's a problem. I don't know. I can't remember what your account for LRA properties, but I imagine they're increasing. Much of North St. Louis is just unimaginable. It's like you got a whole nother town or city that you're dealing with. I didn't have so many again. This is like this large ward, which is minus the second largest geographical ward in the city behind the 13th. I have communities I abut it, but just never. I want everybody to have to come and be an older person for a month in what was the fourth ward because I didn't have that. And that part of the fourth ward that they, my community in Kingsway West, I'm sorry, East, that they gave to the fourth ward, I've had to, since I've been in office, well, I knew I was going to get it, so I started then. I've tore down 39 houses to rectify what was done with illegal gerrymandering redistricting, which was not. So you literally can drive down my neighborhood and to the uh, west of Kings, of uh, Euclid, you see all the big houses and gate, gated area, and to the east, which was really still really nice housing, but 25 years of total neglect, or uh, 22 years, I guess. I'm just dem demoing now. We can't even save them. Half walls are down. LRA, you know, I wrote to them about what is your plan? Can you do a plan by neighborhood where you would um, make an assessment of can this be saved? Because if it can be saved and it's not going to be too much, I'm all for it. I've been rehabbing since 1979. Let's save them. Let's put a roof on them. Let's get the tuck pointing or whatever. Um, but if you can't be saved, you're hurting a neighborhood to leave these vacant buildings um, in the community. So and then I found out that LRA had pulled away from the building division so that the building division wasn't doing much with LRA anymore, which I think is a shame. And they were making that their own little playground. And, you know, so they would have to get to if they could tear them down or not. And so I found out that getting demolition under LRA is different than getting demolition under regular uh, city property or pro private property, I'm sorry. So if we're not inspecting homes, um, and we're not doing exterior especially. Then we have this part in this legislation that says, well, if somebody is living in there, even though there's part that's not you know, up to code, that you can still let them be in there. Don't you kind of see at some point that could be a legal problem for the city, if, especially if it's a really bad problem and we're letting people stay in a, in a building that maybe their apartment looks all right on the inside, but the building is crumbling down. That becomes a legal problem to me for the city. So I just want to, you were at the hearing, I wasn't. How do we explain that when we have a lawsuit and somebody yeah. gets hurt? Uh, that particular topic, I don't recall coming up at the committee hearing, but I agree that that's a huge issue. Um, you know, I think, as you know, I, before I bought my house on Tennessee Avenue in Dutchtown was actually looking at buying in the Kingsway East neighborhood on, uh, uh, Northland place and a uh, really cute home it, and for the most part that block is you know remained fairly intact uh, thankfully 
Um, but I think from, you know, again, going back to the issue with vacancy and then folks who are staying in the homes and this, this bill specifically, you know, it says inspectors may, inspectors may, inspectors may, inspectors may, there's no shall in there. Um, and so at the end of the day, there's still a great amount of latitude with respect to the uh, building division and what they're able to do. Um, but again, unless they're fully staffed and they're you know, evaluating every property in the city of St. Louis, this is not going to reverse the decay or decline of the housing stock that we have in our neighborhoods. So right now we're going to establish a rental uh, registry, which I don't have a problem with, okay? Although you can really find out pretty easy by calling the building division or uh, going on to city sites about who owns a property, okay? It's not, uh, but it's just that one property. But oftentimes we have across the city somebody who's a problem property owner in various different wards or neighborhoods. Can we find out who that is just by going on site and looking? Uh, there, there is actually a tool, uh, I think Geo St. Louis allows you to do that to a degree, but um, oftentimes when I have found myself in those situations, I have to rely upon the NIS and their team to be able to um, kind of aggregate that data for me. Um, because sometimes landlords, as you know, have different LLCs they operate under as well. And so there might be one person who the uh, city councilor's office or the uh, NIS team are aware of, but they're maybe not as aware of all of the different LLCs that that individual is operating. And can, do you have any reason to believe that there's a reason why we don't have our database set up in the census office like they do in the county? Because in the county, you can go put in Cohen or Tyus, and it will bring up every property that you own. Can you maybe give me some? Most of us as citizens are uh, reliant upon the property search function tool, uh, and it's specific to address only, not name or anything like that. I also see here in this uh, board bill, it says that an owner of a rental unit does not reside within the city. The owner shall designate a local agent. That's already the thing in the city of St. Louis, is it not? That if you are not, you, if you have property and you're not here, you're supposed to have a registered agent. And that's why a lot of times when people get notices, they don't put the registered agent or they don't say where they're moved. And the city only has to use your last known address. Is that correct? My uh, recollection of that was uh, it was bill passed by Craig Schmid, the former alderman of the 20th Ward, that uh, required uh, property owners who lived outside of the St. Louis region to register with a local agent. So, uh, and I believe that they did not even uh, or were not allowed to use PO boxes; that they had to have a local address in the. And so um, that that is a an ordinance that has already been passed by this body. And actually before Craig, Mr. Gregali of the 14th Ward also did a bill like that. So we've had several versions of that bill, but my point is that that already exists and it's a very good thing, except for it doesn't work because nobody does it half of the time. And then when something adverse happens to the property, then you hear the owner. Um, right now, Sweetie Pies is coming up on the 4900 block of Martin Luther King, and the person who owned a piece of property that I ended up blighting with him in the domain, I sent him letters, I called, like, and it's in my neighborhood in Kingsway East on the edge. He would not respond. But, and even um, after we had the hearing, he, it's in the paper and everything, then he's like, I didn't get the notice. That's, he didn't get the notice because he didn't change his address. Now, I knew what his phone number was, so I took the uh, extraordinary step of calling him and leaving him messages. And the person that he was talking to said he laughed and said, I'm, they're not going to get my property. I don't have to answer. They can't do anything about it. But that was wrong. But my point is that just having these ordinances with no backup, it sounds really great until you get into the weeds. And the point that you made and the other one from the 13th made about, please, people, go to housing court. Please go to the housing court and see how they let people get away with things. Our ordinances are pa pieces of paper, toilet paper. Doesn't mean a thing. If there is not a, some kind of compliance, and I'm not talking about for, for an old lady who 
or old, older gentlemen who just can't get it done. But they let people come in. They don't have any history of how many violations they have in the city, because that makes a big difference to me. If you come in and you, you start looking at a, somebody who owns eight pieces of property and all of them are slum lords, then we need to do something. If it's somebody who's really trying to uh, do right and just needs a little time, none of us have a problem like that. You as a property owner, older woman, Boyd owns property, I own property. I don't think any of us want to be slumlords. I know I don't. Nobody, I, I, if I get a citation, then it, I'm, it's getting fixed. The only time I've ever got a citation was on my own house when my husband was negligent in putting our roof shingles back, and I called the building inspection myself, and it got done, because he's one of those people that needed a little push. But... Um, so we're not saying that we don't need something. We're saying we need something that's enforceable, that can be, um, that can be uh, an accountability to, and whatever we need to do to hire more building inspectors, that's what we want to do. Because passing laws that says, well, you have to inspect a rental unit every three years, but the house next door, you don't have to inspect. And you don't have to inspect outside the exterior before anybody wants to move in a neighborhood, they drive through the neighborhood, they look at what the neighborhood looks like, and they don't get to see what's inside. They get to see what's outside. If your neighborhood is poorly maintained on the outside, you're running people away. And I want to say more about North St. Louis. North St. Louis, we don't pay our fair share of taxes. And I've been saying this for years, and it's not a thing that people want to say. We don't pay our fair share of taxes because our houses are not valued correctly. Um, when Stephen Conway became the assessor, he called me up and said, Tyus, you've been saying this for a long time. Well, they're not because redlining, everything else. Um, a house in Kingsway East should easily sell for $300,000. Easily. And that's the smallest house, okay? Um, but it doesn't. And so when that doesn't happen, you don't pay your taxes the same, and you also don't support the school board. When we were doing the senior tax freeze, the one thing I disagreed with was that we should have, um, in the senior tax freeze, included the parts that have been historically redlined and gave them a tax freeze and then raised up the taxes and valuation to what they are supposed to be because everybody ought to be paying their fair share of the taxes. And if also, if we're going to do all these things about uh, we're going to change uh, platen petitions and let people do what they want to. My suggestion is that they do them in the places where they've gotten tax abatement exorbitantly. We can look at the old 17th Ward, 28th Ward, parts of downtown. Don't try to put that, because everything is a benefit and a burden. Don't try to put that, that burden on the places that haven't gotten no benefits from being in the city of St. Louis. And don't try to uh, pass legislation that you really do not even have an understanding of how that works. To get up and say, well, the building division wants them, those people to have it, when every other ward in the city had the right to determine their own self-determination. Um, and if that new alder people who have the old 18th ward, if they want to do it, that's their elected official. I didn't choose to do it because I had heard Alderman Kennedy's reason, and I was having my conversations with people. And I will, when, if you all pass this, I'm going to come back and ask for it to be taken out because the building division has no right to tell these black people who d determined they didn't want that for whatever their reasons. And that, pr that, that precinct that I own, and a precinct and a half, is predominantly African American, although I have white people there too. And I do believe with conversations you can do what you do not do when you force things down people's throat. And so that is a problem with me. I have one other question for you, and then I will let you sit down. Um, oh, here it is. If you look at page 14 of 17, it says, 20, on line 9, 25.56130, reporting by code officials. Three years after effective date of this ordinance, the Board of Aldermen may by majority vote request a report prepared by the code officials detailing the compliance with the, with the rental registration program, the challenges with implement, implementation recommendations for updates to the program or amendments to this ordinance to increase program compliance as an analysis of this of the inspection period for rental dwelling units. Such reports shall be kept by the city register and shall be available to the public upon request. And again, I don't understand why 
since we already have a right to that report every year, whatever it is, good, bad, or indifferent, that we're now saying, and that a majority vote, we can get that report. That is, to me, taken away from the rights, and you cannot take away from a right that's already under the charter anyway. We could pass all the ordinance we want. It doesn't mean anything. It's toilet paper. It's not legal. So that is not legal. The ordinance is not legal, that part right there, because we can, and if the board would do it, we can demand a report from every, every department every year. Alderman, I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was just wanting to bring your attention that that's where I read the, uh, oh. about the, the getting the report three years from there, okay? okay? I wanted to show you that I knew I had read it. I didn't underline it. Usually I highlight so I can remember it, but I knew that that was in there. And I'm just wondering why would we want to have less power than it's already given to us under the charter? And then can you give me some insight on that? So I think, and I don't want to speak for this, but I believe that that's in there specifically for the rental registry program itself, mm -hmm. not for the building department as a whole. So since there's the three-year annual inspection or three-year regular inspection uh, that they were hoping to have a report published prior or around the same time as the reinspections would be due for the, the rental registry. So and this I is a report specifically that. to the rental registry. But if we wanted to ask for it every year, we could get it under the charter. Is that not correct? I would believe so. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman from the third. Thank you, Madam President. Um, one other topic that just kind of uh, came to my recollection as I was having the uh, debate conversation yielding for questions of the alderman from the uh, 10th, 12th, 12th, 12th ward. Thank you. Um, that's right. Alderman from the 10th is sitting right in front of me. Um, I feel like I'm missing a party somewhere. Uh, everyone's off the floor at the moment. But um, one of the things that came up, you know, during our, uh, you know, questions here is just another example of where I, my frustrations lie with the building division. And that is another piece of legislation that we passed. It was sponsored by Alderwoman Casey Star Triplett at the sixth ward, which is the vacant building initiative. Vacant buildings are getting, if they're on the registry, if they're on the registry, which obviously we don't have inspectors out in the neighborhoods putting buildings on the registry any longer, which is a damn shame. Uh, but if they're on the registry, that piece of legislation stated that they're supposed to get inspections, they're supposed to get boarded up, they're supposed to get grass cuttings, and anyone who is on that registry is supposed to be given a $500 fine unless they're uh, in compliance, unless they're in compliance, with building codes and their forestry you know, violations. So if they're in compliance, then they wouldn't get the fine. But if they're not, they're supposed to be given a $500 fine. We are not inspecting those properties. We are not adding properties to that registry unless it's filed as a complaint by a neighbor. And even then, questionable as to whether or not it ends up on the VBI. So again, another piece, I, Alderwoman from the 12th kept referring to ordinances as toilet paper. I, I don't know if I would necessarily go that far. Um, but it does feel that way right now, having this conversation, um, for sure. Uh, because it's yet another example of an ordinance where we as a body, a legislative body, have critical issue within our communities and have not seen the results of the intention of that legislation. And it's sitting right in front of us, right in front of us. It's a staffing issue on the building division. Again, if we do not have inspectors on the ground doing the work, then none of this matters. Absolutely none of it matters. And we have multiple examples 
over decades where this has continually persisted to be a problem. You know, last week when we acknowledged, you know, the commissioner, I don't know if I was able to stand last week, but, uh, you know, I, I did send him a, a congratulatory text message. You know, he has always been very responsive uh, to any issues that I have brought forward. His responsiveness as an individual is not indicative of the condition of the department in which this legislative body and the Board of Estimate and Apportionment have directly defunded the building division over decades. That is not his fault. You know, he probably could have done a better job advocating for the department. You know, I would say that. But at the end of the day, when there was an issue that I needed help with, he was there. So I don't want that to be conflated with the issues that we're talking about today. But I thought that the alderwoman from the 12th Ward made an excellent point as well with respect to demolition. I talked earlier about how we don't have uh, St. Louis has plenty of housing. We have plenty of housing. We have plenty of vacant housing that our neighbors see day in and day out, next door to them, on a block over from them. What we are missing is quality housing, and we should be focusing on dealing with rules, laws, processes, budgets that allow us to address the concerns of affordable housing and quality housing in the city of St. Louis. The VBI, you know, another example of a tool that is underutilized or not utilized in some cases. Paul McKee, not to mention any particular name, but it's a name that comes up quite frequently in the media and other reports and social media. Most of the property that Paul McKee has owned over the years is vacant. It should be on the vacant building initiative. It should be getting a $500 fine. It should be having its grass cut at least twice a year. It should be boarded up. Uh, you know, there's a hospital somewhere that's not vacant right now, so I, I'm, try, I'm being kind. Um, I'm trying to be truthful as well. So there. So I think you know, here we are, you know, yet again talking about another piece of legislation that sounds amazing. It sounds great. I co-sponsored the vacant building initiative with Alderwoman Triplett. I believe I voted in support of the last, you know, bill that increased the fees for the building division to support lead remediation. And I'm sorry if this is sounding redundant at this point in time, but I'm frankly f pissed off. This is an absolute shame that we sell a bill of goods to our residents saying that we're addressing vacant buildings or that we're addressing lead poisoning and remediation efforts, and then it doesn't happen. And so I, f I feel as though I have very legitimate concerns that are backed up in fact and a record of history that these types of bills are not going to change the paradigm that we're hoping to change down here. I'm in conversations currently with the, uh, some city departments around updating our problem property ordinances and housing court. You know, I know that the president's office is also interested in those issues and, you know, hope to partner with them. I know that the administration 
has been looking at those proper, uh, problem property codes and is leaning into them in terms of addressing some of the crumbling infrastructure head on by investing public money into private property to address the citation violations there. And hopefully we'll be able to do that on a more holistic and a broad natured approach to stave the tide in some of our communities. Those are solutions that will help. Those are solutions that make a difference in our communities. Those are solutions that I think will help change the paradigm with respect to the quality housing crisis that we have in this city. This bill, I don't believe does that, as it is codifying things that we already have codified that aren't being done. Um, but again, you know, I'll be voting present because there are things that I do support. I do support expansion of our housing conservation district. I do support, you know, creating an IT infrastructure. There are some good things about this. I just have some very grave concerns about the ability to implement this bill, as has been demonstrated time and time again by our city. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alder woman from the seventh, you are recognized to close. Alder woman from the seventh, you are recognized to close. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Um, I am just grateful for all of you all's considerable, uh, for all you all's favorable consideration of the rental registry today. Um, I do understand that this bill does not solve all of the problems that are in place. I've never seen a piece of legislation solve all of the problems that are in place. I do understand that there are many issues that exist with our building division and that this certainly won't solve all on them. But again, what this, what this bill does do is have the ability to move us forward, to address some things that we know are problems. I suspect that budget is coming up in many departments. We want to talk about having a technology and want to talk about how they can address staffing shortages that are very valid and real with technology. Um, I know for a fact that there are folks within that area um, within the area that are not in a housing conservation program that has posed some difficulties for enforcing standards. I know that we all want to, you know, make sure that when we build, we are building based off of, off of data and knowing and what's ADA co compliant, where are the two bedroom units, where are the three bedroom units. And so while this bill certainly will not solve every problem that we have, it will progress us forward. And while I respect all of my colleagues, I think all of our wealth of experiences, I will also really enforce that the department who has to be on streets and has to be on the ground and has to do this work and is doing it day in and day out, has said that they like this bill, have been at the beginning of the conversation since this bill started, and have said that the things in this bill will help move them forward. So thank you for that, and I would like us to go ahead with perfecting Board Bill 180. It has been moved by the Alderwoman from the 7th, seconded by the Alderman from the 9th, that we perfect Board Bill number 180, Committee Substitute. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn, Alderman Narayan, Alderman Vollmer, <laughs> Alderman Velasquez, Alderman Sanye, Alderman Spencer, Alderman Browning, Alderman Clark Hubbard, Alderman Keys. No. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Aldrich. President Green. Please add me as a co-sponsor and I. Ele 11 I votes, three no votes, and one voted present. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderwoman from the 7th to perfect Board Bill Number 180, Committee Substitute. Board Bill 60, Committee Sub, sponsored by Alderman Narayan, President Green, and Alderwoman Velasquez. 
An ordinance pertaining to the excise laws of the City of St. Louis, repealing ordinance number 68536, as amended by ordinance number 69346 and ordinance number 69346, presently codified as Title 14 of the Revised Code of the City of St. Louis, having as their subject matter definitions, establishment of excise division, general regulation, general violation, general license, manufacturer, wholesales, distributors, retail license, non-intoxicating beer license, license transfer, and enacting in lieu thereof a new ordinance pertaining to the same subject matter containing a severability clause, emergency clause, and a penalty clause. Alderman from the 4th, you are recognized on the perfection of Board Bill 60, Committee Substitute. Hello. Oh, here we go. Uh, thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we perfect board bill number 60, committee substitute. Second. It's been moved by the alderman from the fourth, seconded by the alderwoman from the seventh, that we perfect board bill number 60, committee substitute. Alderman, you may. Uh, thank you. Before I get started, we do have two amendments uh, that are both in the drive and on your desk. Uh, both of these amendments were as a result of committee discussions between I and the alderwoman from the eighth. They are, uh, they've been vetted by uh, the city councilor's office. Uh, the first amendment uh, just lays out a more clear definition for the word affiliated. And the second uh, amendment uh, orders the commissioner to uh, ensure that, uh, that there's a finding that uh, any license issued will, will or will not constitute a detriment to the neighborhood. I would move that we adopt Amendment number one and two to Board Bill 60. It's been moved by the alderman from the fourth, seconded by the alderwoman from the tenth, that we adopt amendments number one and two to Board Bill number 60, committee substitute. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Alderman, you may proceed. All right, so I guess now we have board bill number 60 committee substitute as amended in front of us. I'm going to try and follow the advice of the alderman from the fifth and keep this under three minutes. Um, so this has been the, law, the, 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 the most complicated bill I've had to deal with since uh, the short-term rental that we had to discuss here uh, uh, in the weeks past. Uh, wh what we're trying to do here is balance the desire of people who want to see more density in their business districts versus people who don't want to see bars and nightclubs in the business districts along with restaurant owners, many of whom live in the city, and looking at uh, revenue brought into the city. So we have had three committee hearings. Uh, it's been about six months since this was uh, introduced. Actually, yesterday, or excuse me, tomorrow will be the six-month mark. Uh, we've made many, many, many changes after uh, the committee hearings and hearing from more than 20 different neighborhood associations. Uh, we've incorporated changes at the request of the alderman, uh, excuse me, alderwoman from the 12th, specifically to address liquor moratoriums, to exclude those liquor moratoriums from this. Uh, the alderwoman, the, the alderwoman from the 8th, the alderman from the 14th, to address issues particular to downtown uh, and uh, issues that alder, the alderwoman from the 1st brought up to, uh, to make sure that we were incorporating the uh, input from the neighborhood associations. As, long as, as well as the last uh, two amendments that uh, were just brought uh, at the request of the Alderwoman from the 8th. Uh, at the last uh, meeting that we had with the Alliance of Neighborhood Associations, there was, I think, 23 different neighborhood associations on the call. They uh, said, you know, th this is the way that legislation should be done. No one got everything they wanted, but I think everyone got got something that they were looking for to, to make this a, a better piece of legislation. Uh, and we're, we're trying to make it easier to, to do business in the city of St. Louis. I think uh, one of the points brought by Ben Perimba, uh, the uh, James Beard award-winning restaurateur and committee, uh, just is stuck in my head. Uh, he wanted to know why it takes him more than nine months to get a liquor license in the city, and it takes him two weeks in the county. Uh, with that, I ask for your favorable consideration. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 8th. Madam President, members of the board, I just want to commend uh, the sponsor and the body here for putting this back into committee and having some additional conversations. 
uh, as well as the members of the general public who weighed in and helped kind of make some amendments make this better. I do think we're in a much better spot and one, um, as the sponsor pointed out, um, you know, ha represents a good compromise. Um, the amendments, just for clarity, you know, kind of add, you know, we, we are, we're talking about making sure that no uh, applicant that has any delinquent taxes or has any nuisance properties uh, could get a liquor license under this, and this does apply now to any affiliated member of those LLCs. I think it's a really important amendment to make sure that, you know, we're not just applying it to a new LLC that may be opening up a new restaurant, but anybody affiliated with LLC. We can nip some of the problem owners, uh, you know, before they get they get going. So I just want to commend these couple of amendments here um, and the process of, of our committee work here on this board bill. Thank you. Alderman from the fifth. All right. <clears throat> Had to make sure it was green. I'm getting old and colorblind. Uh, just to put on myself on the record, you know what a fan of brevity I am. So. Uh, I believe I'm the only one in this room that has a liquor license. I've had one for 35 years, probably more than some of you folks have been alive. And I know that having a liquor license is not a right, it is a privilege. Doing business in certain neighborhoods and among neighbors is a privilege. And you need the neighbor's input to say that here's your liquor license in 90 days, we will see if you do well or don't do is like giving a 12 year old a driver's license and saying hit the streets and let's see if 90 days you haven't killed someone. So what you're doing is taking a substance that is mind altering. I'm well aware of this and I love alcohol. It's my business. It is something I cherish. Having a drink amongst friends is one of the most sought after things in life for many people. But to say, here's a liquor license just because we need more tax revenue to make it easier for you to get a liquor license to supply something you may not know how to control or serve or understand. Here, in 90 days, we're going to have a hearing. Now, to my recollection, the excise division needs employees. We don't have enough excise officers. That's the main problem in getting our hearings and our licenses done quicker. We have an understaffed, underfunded excise commission. So in closing, please understand that yes, I want everyone to open businesses as much as they can in the city of St. Louis, but to serve a controlled substance to the public, not understanding the proper way to do it without training. There is no training built into any of this. So take that for what it is. And remember, think about a 12-year-old driving down King's Highway without a license. Thank you. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th. I'm worried. That's what I was going to say. That is exactly the analysis. Um, I'm sorry, Madam President and members of the board. That was exactly the analysis I had with people. The discussion is that we have changed things around. You don't have a right to a liquor license. You do not have a right to a liquor license. And I use the thing of when your kids get to be 10 and 12, they say, I want to drive. They don't have a right to a driver's license. In fact, we're putting more regulations on driving, and we made it so that people cannot drive with the friends in the car. You can't text all of these things as you get your driver's license because you just don't have a right. It's a privilege. Liquor is a privilege. And mostly they want to go into F neighborhood commercial districts. I get a lot less sensitive about these things if they go to G, not even G, probably H or, or lower. The purpose of an F neighborhood commercial district is to establish and present those commercial and professional facilities that are especially useful in close proximity to residential areas. That's what the alderman from the fifth was talking about. This is a, oftentimes restaurants are in very close proximity to residential areas. People can come and go, their business can come and go. It's hard for homeowners to get up and move their property or just sell their property, especially if you've already created a nuisance 
if there's already a nuisance going on, then that property, nobody wants to have a nuisance. I am just highly um, impressed with that the alderman who actually has a liquor license then still gets the importance of making sure the people surround you, that being the residents who have to sleep at night, that they feel like that they have an input. They don't always agree because sometimes people get a liquor license and they've disagreed, but they've had a input. Platt and petition was put in part, place for a reason. Um, people talk about why it takes you so long to get a restaurant license. It is because when they were putting these laws into effect, they took into account that people used to come and say, oh, I have a restaurant. Um, and it wasn't a restaurant, it was really a bar. And they would have these liquor licenses and they wouldn't have much food. And then people were drinking and getting drunk and Mothers Against Drunk Driving was very strong then. And they would get out and they would get on the road and they didn't have anything in their um, stomachs and they would drink. Those were not restaurant uh, bars, those were bars. And they couldn't get in under bars in certain neighborhoods so they start calling themselves restaurant bars. Um, and as they did more and more and more, and there were more accidents, the liquor re requirements were put in place to stop that from happening. One of the things that they did to stop people from saying that they were a restaurant bar is that they required them to establish as a restaurant to show that they were really a restaurant. They, they got a percentage of the, that, that they had a certain percentage of sales for food and then that when they got their liquor, it has to only be a certain percentage of their total sales, or it was not a restaurant bar. I do appreciate that the sponsor has worked very hard, and I'm glad he didn't pass that previous bill, because that would not have been illegal. I would have been legal at all. That was a mess. So you did clean it up. I did read all 140 pages of that. I haven't got through all of this one. I'm still reading it, but it's a better bill. I always say if you're going to pass something, at least don't have the first line and the last line and in between wrong. So I'm glad that you did get with people and you went over it because you found errors that just you didn't mean to make, I'm sure. And he explained to me that uh, Macs and uh, regular computers and sometimes don't speak right. So what was printed out was maybe not what he intended, but it was what was introduced as a board bill and had we passed that it would not have been legal because it would have been um, repealing the wrong ordinances, first of all. Um, <coughs> if the alderman from, only I cough, but thank you. If the alderman from the fourth would yield. The alderman from the fourth yield to questioning from the alderwoman from the twelfth. It'd be my pleasure. Alderwoman from the twelfth, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, Alderman, so you heard the Alderman from the 5th talk about that the life, liquor license is a uh, privilege, not a right. Do you believe that? Absolutely. Um, so, um, have you, and you have a lot of restaurants in your ward, because I eat all over the city, so. Um, we, you, we do have a good amount of, uh, of, of both bars and restaurants. Okay, and so, um, have there been any problems in your community that you to speak of, of people who couldn't get liquor licenses, and, and, and if it has, was there a reason why? The, there have been some issues. Uh, most of those, frankly, have been with uh, package liquor licenses, um, and th that's a whole different beast that uh, we're not addressing here. There have been some issues even with um, like wine bars and things, though, because as you get uh, more density and you go vertical more, it becomes harder and harder to get uh, actually in touch with people. And uh, ultimately, Excise is working off sometimes really dated sets of data on the individuals who actually reside at any given location who need to sign the platen petition. Uh, this helps to address that as well. Okay, and I see with the wine bars or in restaurants, if you open up a bottle of wine, then you can take that wine with you um, with certain packaging re requirements. Is that correct? So. Um, my understanding of, of, of that, and I, I, I'm certainly not an expert there, is that uh, yes, under Missouri state law, that they can uh, basically put, put something over the top of that, and you can take the remainder of your bottle of wine with you from a restaurant 
or uh, a wine bar uh, in order to uh, not have to drink a bottle of wine just because you go out. And it's actually in your in your ordinance there, okay? Your yeah, ordinance. That, that, that is the existing ordinance. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, which I think is good because I wouldn't want people to um, say, okay, it's time for closing, let's th turn it up, and then that's when you Yeah, no, we, we certainly don't want that. <laughs> exactly. And, and we have dram laws. We have dram laws for people who serve too much liquor at one time, is that correct? Oh, absolutely, and, and most places that, that have a liquor license do have uh, dram shop liability insurance. Uh, I'm sure the alderman from the 5th could probably speak to that more than I could. I've run into it a few times in my uh, uh, previous career, but the, uh, I, I know that a, a smart bar owner oftentimes will have dram shop liability insurance just in the, uh, in the event that uh, someone is overserved and gets into an accident, so on and so forth. So, um, and I spoke to you about um, the concern in North St. Louis about why we had all these moratoriums starting with Mary Ross in the early 90s. You can find that one listed under her in the early 90s, and it's because while your side of the town and other parts were having a hard time getting liquor, we were having an overabundance of liquor, and people would show up and testify against it, and that's why I don't believe in the Board of uh, uh, Adjustment. I wish they would all go away someplace because they pushed things in North St. Louis that we have no business having. And then when shootings and things happen, their family is not next to it. And in North St. Louis, there are gas stations with liquor right up against people's houses. That there's no place I could find that except for something that has been in existence for 30 years or more. Like if you go on Hampton, there's a little... Uh, it used to be a Clark station, I think. Right I think down, it's a mobile now that you're talking about. Right down from the Carpenters. Yep, yep. Right. So, so there's a BP on uh, the east side of the street, and there's a mobile on the it's a Well, whatever it is. It used to be a long time ago, I think, a Clark station. And so they're next to residential. But anything new, you do not build that next to residential because besides the fact that you're bringing all this traffic and um, smog and gasoline, noise, but they tend to have a lot of problems. The other things you do not have in um, South St. Louis uh, is you don't have all these people who don't live in your community. You have, big, you have uh, QT. We have immigrants who think they have a right to have a license, even though they're having two, three, four, five shootings. I, I, I will note that both that BP and that mobile are owned by immigrants. Uh, right, but I'm just saying, so to go to why we wanted um, moratoriums is because we were getting more and more. If you go down King's Highway, starting from Del Mar, you got a gas station at Del Mar and King's Highway, Hodemont and King's Highway, uh, where's the next one? Um, King's Highway and Martin Luther King, King's Highway, St. Louis Avenue, and King's Highway and um, Natural Bridge. There was no need. We had a we had every kind of thing, moratorium, everything, and yet there's still one at Kings Highway and St. Louis Avenue. So, uh, and, and this would not address those. Those are packaged liquor. Uh, th this does not change anything in the process for a packaged liquor. No, no, but does it, doesn't it change? That's what I'm getting to. So the moratorium um, says no new pla liquor licenses. But in your, re in your legislation, you allow the commissioner to let a restaurant, say they're a restaurant, and open up for 30 now, what they have to have, do they have to have a liquor license? They do. Okay, so then the moratorium says no more new liquor licenses. And so we specifically, at your request, Alderwoman, specifically stated that this does not uh, overrule any, uh, any moratorium. So if there's a moratorium in your ward, um, that, that, that I, we're, we're treading very lightly on that. We, we don't want to uh, take away your ability to... Uh, to, to, to your community's voice and what's going in your ward. Um, and so I thank you for that because you and I had a conversation about somebody. I had a moratorium that I put on informal because there's some places that I want to withdraw from my moratorium where we yes, going to restaurants. And um, so I want to be able for them to have it in a proper place where it's not up against um, housing. Um, the, uh, I have a gas station in my ward that I built, but I made him buy the whole block for him to do the gas station. 
so he's not up against housing. It really is uh, very detrimental to a place, be it a gas station, if it's a lot of things going on, and you can't sleep at night. And, and that restaurant has more rights than you do. And then the problem becomes um, going through the nuisance. You and I have had conversations. If we had a good nuisance, and we have a good nuisance law, they just don't follow it. But if, we had, if it was being followed correctly, then we would close those sites down and we wouldn't be having so much of a conversation about that. Because nobody wants good businesses to go away. If you're a good business and you're not hurting anybody and you're just coming in and you're quiet, what we're worried about is that you're going to put things in that people don't want. Or you can become, there could be too many. Now, in certain places, I think we need to have, and we do, I think, have like restaurant um, districts or something like that. Because... That entails that there are going to be restaurants with liquor. But when we're going to, let's, I don't even know a street, a quiet little street right behind the Carpenters. What is that, Sutherland? I don't know what that street is. But if all of a sudden a restaurant wanted to be right there, don't you think those people should have a right to say we don't want that there? Sure. Um, so so uh, I think the, uh, two points to address that. First, this bill also gives the excise division a lot more teeth than they currently have to address not just uh, the restaurant bar category, but also packaged liquor stores, bars, nightclubs, so on and so forth. If there's an issue under this legislation, the excise division can go in and shut a place down for 72 hours at the sole discretion of the excise commissioner. Uh, currently, you'd have to go through the court process, as we've seen, as we've seen with some other uh, establishments in, in the city. Uh, and that can take quite some time to move through the civil courts process. So this, this gives the excise division a, a much bigger stick than they currently have. Uh, as far as a, an individual location, say it's neighborhood commercial, we have the conditional use hearing process and then a separate hearing for a temporary liquor license. Uh, so there, there, before anything would be issued, first the neighborhood could weigh in on whether it was an appropriate parcel for a restaurant at all. Okay. And so, you know, in, in, uh, on a, any particular parcel, the, and we have robust neighborhood associations in the fourth ward, but uh, the, the neighborhood association, the aldermen, and the, the people directly affected can either write a letter or show up and testify uh, that this particular should or should not be used for this, and the conditions surrounding that, whether it's, it needs to be closed at 10 o'clock at night or... Uh, no amplified music, um, uh, no, no service on the patio. You know, these are common things that, that I've seen, based, and I'm, I'm sure your, your experience is similar. Right. And I, that's good. So when they have that conditional use and it's just a restaurant, will there be a notice that that restaurant, so this is something that's a nuance. To me, then, there should be something that says this restaurant could also have a liquor license. So, so what we're doing to address that at the request of the alderman from the first, uh, unlike uh, the previous situation, uh, I should say the current situation, uh, the status quo right now is that, uh, you know, they post this, you know, eight and a half by 11-ish uh, piece of paper that uh, the weather can affect and uh, or someone can tear down or deface um, to, to alert the, the, the neighbors that there is a, an excise hearing that's taking place. Under this legislation, at the request of the alderwoman from the first, the excise division is actually going to mail a postcard to everyone affected under the, 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 the what would be the plat um, at every hearing along the way to let them know when that hearing is, that they can submit written testimony, that they can go up and testify. So I think there's actually more notice than the status quo right now. Would that be, so right now, that is already when you actually apply for liquor, but you're saying you're adding the additional step of a conditional use that it would be done. So there, there'd be the conditional use uh, for, for any restaurant that would be in the neighborhood commercial, and then if they apply for a liquor license, right away at that application phase, there's going to be a postcard that goes out to everyone to say, hey, there's been a a uh, request for a liquor license here, here's the hearing, and then each hearing along the way, it would be uh, at least three hearings before they would be granted a permanent liquor. So they'll get notice of each of those hearings. 
So what would happen? So I would always tell my neighborhood groups, go to it, and then when our conditions would be no liquor. So what happens then? Well, I think that if the conditional use says no liquor, then that parcel is not going to be able to have a liquor license because it won't meet the conditional use. And you don't foresee that the excise commissioner could say, well, in my wisdom, it should be. So that's what I want to make sure. I, I don't believe that that would be the case. I don't think that the excise commissioner has the authority to disregard um, conditional uses. Okay, well, I, and I, again, I haven't finished reading the second one because this is a long one that I read that, I'm, as I said before, I was glad you guys sent that back and, and cleaned it up. But in the original one, there were several parts where you talked about there was a law, but then you talked about if in his wisdom or decision, the excise commissioner could allow it to happen anyway. And um, I, I don't want to be specific right now. I don't know, are you going to suspend the rules and try to pass this today? Uh, 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 I, I mean, I, we, we could not, I don't believe, under our rules, suspend the rules. We, we can perfect it, I, but, but I don't believe that we could third read it, and I don't intend to third read it today. I would like okay, to perfect well, it today. Give it to you, because in several portions, it is, you can't, once you did the amendments, you do have to let it wait. Um, several portions, it talks about um, that this is the rule, but then it allows the commissioner to overturn the rule. And so I always like rules that are there. And, and I'm always questioning, because they're objective. They're for everybody. Sure. And I'm questioning when we make it subjective by letting the excise commissioner, in his wisdom, overturn that. And I wanted to know what was your reasoning for that. Because I did, you know I tried to get in on your hearing couple, several times. Yes, yes, ma'am, yes. Um, and I know that there was a technical issue there. Uh, so uh, basically everything with the excise commissioner uh, th uh, and the excise commissioner's discretion comes from the existing ordinances regarding hearings. Uh, we, we did shore up some of that language uh, with the older one from the 8th to make sure that it was crystal clear that uh, the excise commissioner had to make a finding uh, uh, that it would be detrimental or non-detrimental. Non I think that's a 13-point standard, if I recall correctly, on all the things that the excise commissioner had to, would have to take into account. And a a as we uh, see, my guess is dozens of times a year um, when there's disagreements with that, sometimes they end up in court. But the uh, the the idea would be that there is an official finding by the excise commissioner, and should that be found to be arbitrary uh, for whatever reason, people could certainly uh, certainly push the envelope. Um, but they would have to then shell out money for an attorney. Yes. I think it would depend on which way the the excise commissioner went, I guess. Which way he went, so either the people who don't want it... Either yeah, either the restaurateur or the, the, the you know, the, depending on, on you know, I, I wish we lived in a, in a country where everyone could, uh, you no. know, pu pu push uh, uh, things through the legal system. You know, we want lawyers to be included. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, another part that I had a question about um, was that... Um, so we didn't talk to the people who actually, I know we brought M Miles in, the excise commissioner. Uh, several times. Yes. But the people who've been doing that for a long time, we, did, was there a conscious decision not to include them in and why? I'm, I, I, and I'm could, could you give more clarity on the people who have been doing that for a long time? I, I, I'm just... Right, the excise. They work in excise for 20 and 30 years, and they tend to know... Oh, that. they came out in support at the... I believe it was the second committee meeting they, they came. I think three of them came, and uh, no, two of them came they, and they said were, that they were supportive of this. Okay, because I heard that they were not invited, so I did, I'll look back and see. Um, and um, so if a restaurant gets a liquor, uh, if, the, uh, if, if the commissioner, excise commissioner, lets the restaurant open up, a restaurant and then gives them liquor and then we find out their problem then what he says is you can't have that so under this ordinance the way it would work is so you have uh, let's just say you have that um, uh, that a conditional use hearing 
And so we're, we're, we're going to include that in the, the overall hearings just in general to make sure that the neighborhood has a chance to weigh in. So the neighborhood weighs in and says, yes, this is an appropriate place for a restaurant. We feel like having these conditions for a restaurant, uh, let's say close at 10 and uh, no amplified music on the patio. Um, so we, we've cleared that hurdle then. Then you'd go before your first hearing with the excise commissioner uh, for your liquor license should you apply for one. At that hearing, the commissioner will listen to the applicant and uh, folks from the neighborhood uh, to make a determination as to whether or not the application will be detrimental to the neighborhood or not. If it's not detrimental to the neighborhood, he may issue a 90-day temporary permit. During that 90-day period, then you'd be able to, to sell alcohol. The restaurateur would be able to sell alcohol. Now, during that period, uh, if there's CSB complaints, 911 calls, nuisance complaints, uh, things like that, all of that's going to be taken into account when they come back for a second hearing. And for that second hearing, they may be able to, if, if they're not having issues, they may be able to renew that temporary license for 90 days. The reason for doing two temporary licenses is so that we didn't give a property interest for 180 days, uh, because uh, as, as I, I, I'm sure you're aware, uh, to once someone gets a property interest in a license, it's hard to take it away. But at the end of that 90 days, that property interest just terminates. So we're not actually taking anything. So there's a, a renewal process at 90 days where if you, it, it, they're going to look to make sure your the percentage of your sales is where it should be, uh, food sales versus liquor sales is where it should be, that you're not uh, getting a bunch of CSB complaints, that you're not getting a bunch of 911 calls. The neighborhood has another chance to weigh in. And if you get renewed for the 90 days, then at the culmination of that 180-day period, they'll again look back at CSB complaints, 911 issues, nuisance property complaints, and have another hearing with the neighborhoods present. And at that point, if it's non-detrimental to the neighborhood, the excise commissioner may issue a permanent liquor license. And so it's your understanding that people get a property interest in a liquor right? So that, that's why you have to go through the civil courts process to, uh, to remove one uh, once it's been granted. And so they, once it's been granted, they have to apply every year for that liquor license, right? And so, so to, uh, to uh, get rid of an existing liquor license, like we, we saw at a prominent uh, bar downtown, um, when you try and... Uh, remove that liquor license from someone, oftentimes it ends up in court for 18 months. And during that time, courts typically hold the status quo where you would still be able to serve liquor during that time. We're trying to alleviate that issue by saying the longest you're going to be a problem for is 90 days and then that right, that, that, that property right terminates. And that's just for restaurants, not for any other we're only addressing restaurants in this uh, and, period. And so then restaurants are not going to have a platinum petition after that at all? The, it, it, should a restaurateur choose to go through platinum petition? We heard in uh, committee that some of the restaurateurs uh, enjoyed the platinum petition process. They thought it was a good chance for them to advertise their restaurant, so on and so forth. And in some neighborhoods, that may make sense. And for some individuals, that makes sense. Uh, and for others, it may not. Um, so there, there's essentially two tracks for a restaurant to end up with a liquor license under this. We're not getting rid of plat petition, but you don't necessarily have to do it if you go through this uh, proposed alternative track. So you don't have to do it. So then if you become a problem later, then you would, what would happen? How would you get rid of it? Because right now the easiest way is plat and petition. Because if you're a problem place and you go in that circle, if you've irritated enough people, they don't sign your liquor license at reapplication. And then you're not taking it away. They don't fit the requirements to get it. Sure. So that protest petition language is still in there. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, according to the excise division, seems easier to do. I'm not talking about a protest petition. I'm saying so I have a person who lost their license just recently because been a much of a problem. And so that 350 feet, 
said no, and he could not get enough signatures, so he didn't get any place else. Now he's on my phone every day like, can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? But when we were telling you, hey, you're making enemies around it. So in that case, if you have to have a plant petition, that's a way to get rid of it without being so costly because that's why I like Emma because that's the community saying you're not a good neighbor. And you don't have to try to do nuisance. You don't have to do anything. You just wait for the next time. But if they don't have to do plat and petition. I mean, cur currently restaurants don't do plat and petition every oh, year. Oh, they don't? Okay. No, no, they don't do restaurants. Uh, restaurants don't go through the plat and petition process every year. Okay. We don't, every year, do they go to, through it at all? Or is it just a uh, Initially, they do. See, that's not a problem we had. I told you, you guys have problems we don't because we don't have sit-down restaurants. So, uh, and the ones we do don't have liquor, so that's not been a problem. So currently, I'm, so, I'm sorry, what did you say happened when? The, 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 there's the initial plat and petition process, but there's not, uh, restaurants don't go through an annual plat and petition process currently. So then it would have to be the protest, go get, the petition, go get a, a petition, go and have the community signed in and say a protest, this is a nuisance. What's going on? So, so there, there would be that process. Additionally, we're giving the excise commissioner a lot more teeth. At, at, say there's acts of violence or there's people loitering or you know, any of those 13 detrimental standards. Right. The excise commissioner can then shut down that establishment for 72 hours. And he can do that as many times as, uh, as he, he needs to do. And so... You know, if I have a business and you continually shut it down for 72 hours, I'm probably not going to stay in business very long. And so there's either a, a real incentive to get right and stay right, or else you're not going to be doing business. And I heard you say that we really were concentrating on the restaurants, but I thought I saw something in there about gas stations being able to serve 5% beer or something. Did we change that? Uh, no, nothing in this changes uh, gas station at all. I saw that, but maybe that was, uh, so some of this you just put back in what was already there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the excise code is a hundred some odd pages long, and we, we, we've only made changes regarding the, the restaurant bars. You did do, like I said, it's a lot better <laughs> than that original one. Um, I'm going to tell the teacher on him if he doesn't stop. <laughs> Excuse me. You poke someone's eye out, Alderman from the fifth. <laughs> Leave the lady alone, okay? Um, it is better. Um, I'm going to be a present. You did clean it up. I haven't read it all, so I want to make sure I read everything. So I'm going to be a present, and then I'll be able to ask questions about any of the things that, any other further questions. But if you made it sh perfectly clear that moratoriums are not. That, that is absolutely in there. That was actually the first amendment we made. I talked to the administration after we had a discussion, and I said, we have to make sure that this does not override existing or future moratoriums if we are going to even possibly get the support of the older woman from the 12th. Okay, and then the other thing is, and I heard you say about property rights. So years ago, and I told you I had a, uh, one of the... Uh, ordinances that you were overturning was one that myself, Clay, and basically the whole Board of Aldermen did. It's because this is, and I told you what happened, people will get a liquor license, then they get in trouble, then they close it down because they're getting ready to lose their liquor license. Then they turn around and sit on it for five or ten years, and we discovered this, until when you wait five or ten years, you don't have a history anymore. They can't pull it up and say this is the history. Um, so. I had explained to you why we had that, and I don't know if you still repealed that or not, but I think that's a mistake if we have not used a liquor license. And we gave an exception if there was, a, uh, if there was some kind of natural disaster or you had a fire. And even then, we gave an, a permanent exception. I really wanted to come back and say, if you don't use it in five years, why would we allow somebody to keep a liquor license and they're not using it, and they're riding it. And then they also would transfer it, and you wouldn't even know because they just opened it up in that other person's name, and now they got a clean slate. So I don't know if you um, did take that out or did, if you... We, we addressed the transferring of licenses, but most of that was about the death of a 
exactly. a license holder to, to, to for the continuity of business that if there were two partners in a business and one of them had a, a sudden death that they wouldn't have to go back through the process. And it's also with spouses. Um, I always found it kind of unfair that we let corporations, but I do know why if you have a big snooks or something like that, if they sell it, it becomes Kroger, they should be able to keep it. But it's kind of fair, unfair to the small people who, can't, who could not transfer their license. Um, but the big places don't tend to be right there in the neighborhood, so I kind of balance that reason. But again, so thank you very much for answering my questions. I have no further questions. But Absolutely. Because I have not read all of it. Thank you, Alderwoman. Any further discussion? Alderman from the 5th. Uh, yeah, and it's, no questions. Sit down and relax. <laughs> no, just to clear the air, uh, naturally, uh, I, I'm not too much of an internet troll, but someone sent me something. I am not speaking against this because I have a liquor license and don't want anyone else to have one. <laughs> I have signed for a liquor license or right across the street from me for Pizzeria de Gloria and currently signing the new uh, Marconi, Marconi Mercado, which is opening right across the street from me. I want everyone to have a liquor license who deserves one. Competition is a wonderful thing. We're all in business together. So I am not against anyone else in the city having a liquor license. I have no desire for a monopoly. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Alderman. Alderwoman from the 7th. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, would the alderman from the 4th yield to questions? The alderman from the 4th yield to questioning from the alderwoman from the 7th? Absolutely. Alderwoman, you may proceed. Thank you, alderman. Um, first, I just want to thank you. Um, I know I said it last meeting, I'll say it again. I've really gotten to see you uh, work on this for quite some time. I'm on that committee, so I've heard commentary after commentary and seen this long public engagement uh, process, and I think this bill in particular, because it's been the interest of so many different parties, I've really gotten to see kind of what our democratic process looks like and see all that, all of that. And I think you've done a great job navigating the many different concerns and complexities from different angles. Um, I was just curious, um, anything, anything in your bill, does it deal with zoning? No, I, I don't believe that there's anything in here that deals with zoning. Um, I, I'd have to go through it with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, nothing that I uh, change regarding restaurant bars does. I'd have to go through the other 150 pages of the excise code just to ensure that, though. Um, and because I know your bill is kind of, like you said, you're not eliminating plant petition, you're creating an alternate to it. Was it ever suggested to you any time that you go through the planning commission for this? Uh, not in the discussions that I had with Excise, no. Thank you. And um, you did work with the Excise Commission and the administration on this, right? Yes, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman. I look forward to supporting this today. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Alderman from the 4th, you are recognized to close. All right. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the questions. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that we can uh, perfect this today and move forward into city that uh, it's easier to do business in and more friendly for the, the immigrant communities that we, we welcome in to do business. Um, and with that, uh, I ask for your favorable consideration. It's been moved by the alderman from the 4th, seconded by the alderwoman from the 7th, that we perfect board bill number 60, committee substitute as amended. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderman Aldenberg. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Vollmer. Alderwoman Velasquez. Alderwoman Sanye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderwoman Keys. Aye. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Aye. Alderman Aldridge. 12 aye votes.
Two no votes and one voted present. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the alderman from the fourth to perfect board bill number 60, committee substitute as amended. Board bill 20 sponsored by, I'm um, 220 sponsored by Alderwoman Spencer, President Green, and Alderman Aldridge. An ordinance recommended by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment appropriating $15,300,000 of interest funds earned on the city's funds received under the American Rescue Plan Act 2021 authorizing the transfer of such funds for the convention center project purposes containing a severability and an emergency clause. Alderwoman from the 8th, you are recognized on the perfection of board bill number 2. Alderwoman from the 8th, you are recognized on the perfection of board bill number 220. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, I move that we perfect board bill number 220. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 8th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we perfect board bill number 220. Alderwoman, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, um, what, what board bill 220 does is essentially allocate $15.3 million of our ARPA interest funds, the interest uh, gained from uh, our, our uh, ARPA, unspent ARPA funds and put it towards our convention center. I think, um, you know, uh, convention centers and tourism are incredibly important to a vital downtown. We have uh, our city's downtown um, suffer, uh, quite frankly, uh, through COVID, but also just as a result of a, a loss of population and other issues going on downtown. Um, renovating our convention center, I think, is critical to the success of our city, To um, to uh, try and stem the tide of the lo population loss that our city is experiencing right now. Um, I think it's imperative that we all as a city take a look at the sobering reality of where we are as a community. Um, we are experiencing population loss right now in our city at an unprecedented amount. On the last two years in a row, we saw 2.4% population loss in our city each year out of municipalities in the United States with populations over 50,000 people, of which there are 798. The city of St. Louis population growth is 797. That means there's one place in the United States losing population faster than the city of St. Louis, and it's Jackson City, Mississippi. And if you haven't noticed, they have a potable water issue in Jackson City. So we are really at a very critical point in our city. In order for a city to be successful, we have to have a successful downtown and a convention center and certainly our tourism is an incredibly important piece of that. And so investing this money uh, from the interest of our ARPA funds in our downtown in our convention center I think is critical. Um, of course, we also uh, know that this is only a piece of what um, the convention center needs to complete its full renovations. Um, which is just an, an, a very unfortunate reality of uh, some of the disagreements between the city and the county uh, in funding the convention center. But certainly, I think uh, putting this, these funds, these interest funds from our ARPA funds at our convention center, I think is a very important piece right now. And so with that, um, I'll take questions, but I ask for your favorable consideration of board bill number 220 as we move to perfect it here today. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 10th. I'm going to start holding my mic, all right? <laughs> thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, I just rise in support, and thank you, President Green and all the women from the 8th for bringing this forward, and I would like to be added as the co-sponsor. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please make note of that. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Alderwoman from the 1st. Thank, thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I voted against suspending the rules for this today uh, because we have yet to see money from our city's ARPA funds go to our water division. You know, when we stood up here months ago and I asked you to support a rate increase uh, for our water, uh, one of the things that I said is, well, we haven't designated any city water funds, uh, any city ARPA funds to water because we had allocated all of it. Uh, and now we're starting to see bills or this bill where um, we're allocating some ARPA interest funds to something else um, without having the official language in front of us that we are allocating money from our ARPA funds to the water division. Uh, you know, I noted in the sponsors' arguments for the bill that the only city losing population faster than St. Louis is the city that didn't spend money on their water and is has a crisis happening. In 
water. Uh, so, you know, I, I do believe that we will be allocating um, money to the water division coming up, but I just didn't want this bill to move faster than it would have through the normal course of our process here uh, to perfect it before we saw that committee substitute, before we'd adopted that committee substitute. Uh, so, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that the Convention Center has, in recent years, gotten over $240 million of city and county funds from city and county bonds and from RAMS funding off the top. And the bill that I introduced today for the water division is just under uh, $6 million. Uh, so it's, it's pretty different how much we're spending and how much money is coming in from the outside for these things. In the um, frequently asked questions of the water rate bill, we did mention uh, money from the state ARPA coming in, which I don't believe this is, this is the bill of that happening, but also $45 million from the federal government that I don't believe has come in yet either. Um, so you know, I'm definitely not against the convention center being upgraded. I agree that the project needs to get finished. My only objection today is really that we still don't have anything in front of us for sure with any votes on it from this board saying that we are funding the water division with money from American Rescue Plan Act funds. And for me, uh, that's just a non-starter. So I appreciate you all hearing me out. And I don't think this bill would be moving forward through perfection today if the votes weren't there. Um, and I, I, uh, I wish the fundraising capability of Kitty Radcliffe could just go to the water division for a few minutes uh, to get some, some of this much there. Thank you so much. Thanks. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th. Um, Mr. Pr uh, Madam President, members of the board, from the 8th would yield. The Alderwoman from the 8th yield to questioning from the Alderwoman from the 12th. Uh, of course, yes, thank you. Alderwoman from the 12th, you may proceed. Thank you. I just heard the Alderwoman from the 1st talk about the 200 and some million dollars that we gave to the uh, stadium. But actually, um, a few years ago, we gave $400 million to the stadium. I didn't, and, I, and I know you were here because myself, the alderman from the 21st, the alderman from the 3rd, the alderman from the 4th, we voted no. We voted no. We talked about uh, the alderman from the 3rd got up and said in 40 years how old he would be. I unfortunately was here when we gave the first amount of money, when we created the stadium amount, which, oh, we would never be coming back and asking for any kind of money like that. And it took us 30 years to pay off that stadium. And we finally did a few years ago. And then we gave them $400 million, And that was going to be what they needed. And that was going to be the, we gave them every ounce of it. We did not even keep $5 for the city of St. Louis. We gave them everything. And then I want to say last year, I think it was um, the alderman from the 7th. Um, was it a? Uh, Jack Coder. John. Jack Coder, didn't we give them another $30 million off of the top of the ARPA, ARPA fund? Is that correct? $40 million. We gave him $30 million. He sponsored the bill. Are you remembering that at all? I do. So that's $430 million. Um, the other one from the first talks about um, us not having any money spent on the water. When I tell you there's no money been spent in North St. Louis at all. Kitty Ratcliffe, please don't call me again. My votes are always going to be no because that is ridiculous to me. Tell them to spend money, put some of their money up and get an interest. But to say that somehow the convention center is more important than the rest of the city of St. Louis is totally ridiculous. There is no amount of money that has been spent in um, in North St. Louis that you can see. And every single day I get a question about what happened to the money. So um, how is it that we're pushing forward this? Is this your bill or was this the administration bill? Because I'm trying to understand how this is being fast tracked, but we can't spend any money in North St. Louis. Is this your bill? Or was this uh, Alder Woman, this is, uh, this is my bill. It was presented through the Board of ENA uh, to the Board of Aldermen. Um, this originally came to us, you probably saw this in the news, as a $20 million package, which included $15 million of interest money from the ARPA funds and $5 million of interest money. From we have revised that, and we're looking at just doing this $15.3 million from interest, interest funds from um, the, ARPA, uh, uh, the ARPA interest pot. Um, you know, I take your point. You know, I mean, there are there. 
about not having investments visible in North St. Louis, um, which is really quite a shame because as part of that ARPA funding, we allocated $37 million specifically to North St. Louis. Whether or not it's been actually invested is a real question. Um, it's one that uh, I've been talking with other colleagues here on the floor today. Uh, we, I'm committed to doing an audit, uh, requesting an audit of those funds in particular to see just where those $37 million have gone. So we can actually take a look at that because this Board of Aldermen did, through our initial ARPA funding, allocate a very significant amount of money to invest in North St. Louis. Um, but your point is well taken and not lost on me that it may not be visible uh, in our neighborhoods there. And not being um, spent. But you, do you remember that we gave the uh, Convention Center the $400 million over 40 years? Is that supposed to be the amount? Is that something familiar to you? Well, that, you know, I mean, and we've also funded the Blue Stadium as something I fought against, as you quite remember, I'm sure. Uh, that was $105 million over 37 years uh, back end. I mean, I'm no uh, stranger to vetting these things um, and taking a keen eye on them. Really that's, scrutinizing. that's not my point. Yep. Because, first of all, the Blues are not paying any rent. So we don't even want to go there. And that's not what we originally passed. So we really don't want to get that because we'll get into the weeds. But I'm just saying, when they got the $400 million, Kitty is really good, invited me over to have lunch over at the convention center and assured me, because she knows I voted no back when we uh, did the football exception that mm -hmm. if we didn't fix that stadium up, that our football team could could leave. And I'm the no vote that said, this is a dumb loophole. And everybody said, oh, no, Sharon, you're just overreacting. Hmm. Um, if only. But so if we gave them 400 and they said that was enough, then Jack came back, Alderman from the 7th, and gave them another 30 million. And then that will be what we need. And then now you're coming back with how much? 15 million. And you're saying, now I'm hearing you say, well, and they're going to still need some more. This is what I know with, about construction, is that as long as they see a pot of money and you keep saying yes, they're going to need more. And the convention center, although you might want it to be something, especially for all the hotel owners downtown, we have spent a billion dollars or more downtown since I've been down here, probably several billion. Even when things we knew were not going to happen, like the convention center hotel, we knew it was going to go under. We spent the money anyway. Then finance. We're we're not going to have any neighborhoods if every time something big wants money, we find a way to do it. We had never even envisioned a soccer stadium, but that's being built. We got uh, free rent for the. Uh, for the uh, blues, and people always ask, how does that happen? Because it happens when it goes over to SLDC. They change what the Board of Aldermen said we were going to do. So do you foresee them not coming back again? Or is, as you said, this is just part of what they need. So you foresee that you will be coming back trying to get more money for the Is that correct? To be honest, uh, Alderwoman, I'm not sure what the rest of the funding looks like. This is an outstanding question, and one that, quite frankly, I may agree with causes some frustration. Um, but, you know, I do know that, um, you know, to your point on construction, when we originally contemplated this, I think it was four years ago, uh, upgrading the convention center, the cost associated with that time was prior to COVID. Um, then there was some disagreement in the county uh, when our current uh, county executive took office following um, some you know, fortunate uh, uh, situation with the prior county executives, executive, excuse me, um, and when the bonds weren't issued in the county, uh, it, we were at a stalemate, and the cost of construction went up considerably due to COVID and a whole bunch of other things. And so here we are, and it's a very unfortunate situation. I'm not arguing with you that it's not an unfortunate situation, and I don't know where the rest of the funding is going to come from. I do know, I do feel like, I do think that investing in our downtown is critical. Um, but to your point, in North St. Louis in particular, the population loss I spoke of is almost exclusively coming out of North St. Louis. Um, and this is extremely problematic and something that we should all be very keenly aware of, that serving our residents in North St. Louis, providing basic city services, um, and providing a, an environment in which people want to stay and raise their families is critical to stemming the tide of that population loss. I, it's not lost on me, and I think it's a very, very important part of making sure that our sick city uh, can have a tax base to do the basics. Uh, failing that, I don't see how we continue. 
And it's not just citizens leaving North St. Louis. It's people that pay the taxes, the people Correct. who can leave anytime they want to. So that affects my neighborhood, not because we're not trying to do everything we can, because we're giving money everywhere except where we said it was. I, um, the auto woman from the 11th, myself and the 13th, we always talk about the businesses. That's not the other part of it. The part of it is also um, supporting the people who have houses, who've been there forever, who fought to even get there because they couldn't live on certain streets because they weren't allowed to. So they're there now. They pay their rent. There's hardly any tax abatement. If you look at the tax abatement and where it's been in North St. Louis, there's no tax abatement at all, hardly, okay? Because these people pay whatever little taxes. They would agree to pay more taxes if their properties was valued correctly. But if we drip, drip, drip all this money away, and as this time goes away, because I cannot forget that on July the 9th, 2001, we allocated these ARPA funds. I will never forget that. We had a 12-hour Zoom. It's very important to me to remember that. That's my mom's birthday, and I was in Decatur trying to celebrate a birthday, and, but we were on that Zoom call allocating that money. Then it came back, and it got changed. It was uh, moved around, and some of it wasn't any longer just in North St. Louis. But the simple fact is we haven't seen any of the money. So when you come back and say, we want, us, we want part of the ARPA funds after we gave the whole amount of money from the convention center, then we gave them $30 million, now we want another $15 million. But we haven't done anything there. I don't even understand who is the mayor that thinks that you don't have to do anything in one part of the city. I don't understand it. I know that there's a certain fund set up. Um, and I think your ward is one of them where they are taking monies and doing houses. But didn't put that in, in parts of North St. Louis. Um, it drips out. It's just, it seems like um, this is a continuation of a bill that started down here under Dick, Ge Dick Gephardt that became the team floor plan. If you don't give people services, the first people that leave are the people who can afford to. Yep. And it's purposeful. It's not an accident. If you don't give them, and they're not asking for, oh, gimme, 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 because they worked. They were teachers and doctors and lawyers. They worked. And so when they can't get the basic services, they're out of here. So I, I really can't purposefully um, vote for anything about giving money. And again, Kitty Radcliffe, don't call me anymore because the answer is no. Um, I can't vote for giving money when we've given the, the stadium, uh, quote, convention center, the first amount of money. We paid that off. We gave them another $400 million for 40 years, which they said, oh, we won't win anymore. We came back and said, well, we got $30 million. We just have to give them. And again, I don't see this. And I don't think that the, I think the convention center has to do what other families do or other people, entities do, which is that they have to curtail some of their big plans and do what they were going to be able to do to with North the amount of money. That's what families and everybody else do um, when they're having problems it's with um, financing and getting things done. So I won't be um, supporting this because I don't see, I see this as a never ending process because we were told when the 300,000, I mean 300 million was paid off, that then we could use some of that money for the city. And we weren't able to use any of that money for the city at all. We didn't use a penny of it. So I don't see how that's going to be okay. You seem to have a response for something. I'm sorry. I, I do. Thank you, Alderwoman, for giving me the opportunity. Um, you know, to your point on the funding that we allocated, according to the city of St. Louis's ARPA transparency website right now, uh, of those funds, those $30 million allocated North St. Louis, 95000 has been spent. So you're <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, I think whether or not the transparency portal has, isn't being transparent with the expenditures or we haven't spent those funds, you're, 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 you're spot on and you're absolutely right. I do know, um, in addition, you know, talking about this population loss, we had one of our region's uh, most esteemed demographers come to the budget and department earlier at the end of last year, Ness Sandoval, to describe for us and to kind of go through uh, not only the population loss, but where that population loss is coming from. And that's where, you know, it was identified. It was primarily coming out of North St. Louis. And we were asking, where are those folks going? And he said, you know, I think a lot of people are assuming that they are going to St. Charles, Chesterfield, and they are, many of them are, but many of them are going to Dallas, Atlanta. Yes. In cities with greater economic activity and greater economic opportunities for their children, less racial um, 
uh, disparities and outcomes, et cetera. And this is a real, should be a very big wake-up call. But I will also say, in addition to this Board of Aldermen funding with $30 million investments in North St. Louis that haven't been spent, we have also funded our city departments to be fully staffed, to be able to do those things that you, Alderwoman, rightfully want for your community, trash pickup, basic city services, those things that these departments are not staffed right now. We know that. We are operating right now at a city staffing level of 70% across the board. 70%, 29% of our vacancy. And with that kind of vacancy in our city departments, we cannot expect to deliver those city services. So it's not for lack of, of funding or allocating those. We have done our job here at the Board of Aldermen to fund those positions in the departments. Uh, it is whether or not they're getting done, and that is the question, and that's a big problem. Uh, but I don't think it should stop us from funding the things we need to fund. I do take your point, and I am happy to, to investigate this with you um, because I think we do need to understand where these, 30, where these funds specifically allocated for North St. Louis actually are. But that being said, going back to the idea of economic activity, without economic activity drive, you know, driven here in the city of St. Louis in the region, um, we're going to continue to see population loss of families who not only are not getting their trash picked up, don't have economic activities, don't see a future for their kids. And convention centers driving uh, uh, new businesses to the city of St. Louis to, con to consider investing in, in our community is an important part of being able to have a robust economic act, uh, plan and future for our community. And that is why I think uh, investing in our convention center is an important investment for all of us. I understand you. Thank you. So I've heard that argument for 33 years. If we just put the money downtown, if we just put that money downtown, um, and I watched Clayton build their bedroom community up and many other people build up their bedroom community, mm. and then their businesses followed. Mm. But they had a bedroom community. They had people own houses and properties, not just Clayton, Webster Groves, Kirkwood, Maplewood, and the businesses grew with that. It has not worked in the city of St. Louis. It has not worked in the city of St. Louis. If we just keep, keep, keep putting money, which is now downtown, is now wanting to partner with North St. Louis to say, well, hey, when you, we know it's your term, but we need some more money. Why I am opposed to giving any more money to downtown is because it won't be any money left. And you'll be able to say, well, you didn't get it spent. As you said, it's not because we don't want it spent. It's not that there's not opportunity. No, I tell you all the time, Vince Shane was my favorite mayor. And why? Because he understood that there were black middle class. And the reason the cities that you named, that's where the black people go, because that's where black middle class are. And the people who come and see me, they say, I'm out of here, Sharon. You just really believe you don't, you've looked at that, that dust or something, but we don't have to stay here anymore. So that's the other part you're leaving out. It's the black middle And so if you don't bill for a black middle class, and that's why a lot of black aldermen now don't want to hear low income, homeless, uh, criminals, uh, they get tired of that because you, know, you talk about restaurants, but you don't have sit down restaurants. That's a shame. You don't have a hardware store. That's a shame. It's been on the books for 30 years. It's ridiculous, okay? So we can have as much liquor as we want to, and it's, but we can't have a hardware store. So that's not our fault. It's the fault of the people who keep then. If you, you uh, take all this money and you allocate it to something else, there'll be no more money. And I don't even know if we're going to get our second half of the half, the, the billion dollars that we're supposed to get. Because at this rate, there's no reason for the government to give us any more money because we can't spend what we already have. Yes, we can. We're not spending. I'm wrong. We're not spending. There's all kind of things to be done. And what you do is you have to talk to people who have been successful. I did $57 million without all of this money because I had people who were willing to work to get it done. Now it seems like everybody, you talk about blocking, when you talk about not having things in North St. Louis for 30 years like a hardware store, but you got 30 liquor licenses at gas stations, there's something wrong with that. It is a problem. It's a problem with that. And we can't say that they're not all, thank you very much. We can't say it's not all connected. It is connected. We have to have somebody who is action-oriented to get things done. You can't be proud if you don't know how to do stuff. You go ask people how you get it done. You don't assume stuff. You say, hey, how'd you get that done? 
I do that all the time. I call anybody I need to talk to to find out if you got something going on. That's how I got the Walgreens, because Irv Clay had put a Walgreens at Union and Page. I dogged those people until I got a Walgreens. So you have to be willing to do it. So um, three years later, because we're going on three years, in July it'll be three years since we allocated those ARPA funds, that you can't see anything. When you're talking about $95,000 or $100,000, that's, that's a house amount. That's a rehab. That even some houses cost more than that to rehab. Mine did. Okay, so you're not talking about any money. And then people, uh, then you want to cover up. You want to say where the five hundred dollars went. The first five hundred, you want to cover up and don't do a, uh, don't sign um, uh, subpoenas so that the uh, treasurer who is running for reelection doesn't have to tell the board of aldermen where the money went, even though we're supposed to be the oversight of mm -hmm. the executive branch. People forget we have three uh, branches. So as long as we can't s spend money in North St. Louis, then I'm just going to use the term that the people said when I said when we were raising the water uh, rates, and I said we should use part of the ARPA funds for water. People sure? said, oh, no, we're going to... Uh, Wait, Use that for something transformative. And here we are now, seven months later, doing the very thing that I said should have been done, and I am on tape, which is we're going to spend it toward the water, because water is transformative. And so is keeping people of all different races and, and neighborhoods in a community. When right. you, it's embarrassing when you give those, uh, those, those uh, accountings of how much has been spent. Other woman, I don't have any more questions for you. I just want to say I can't vote for this. Um, because of that. And I would like to know if the alderwoman from the 13th would yield to questioning. Yes. The alderwoman from the 13th yield to questioning from yes. the alderwoman from the 12th. Alderwoman, you may proceed. Thank you. Alderwoman, do you remember when we first reallocated that first $400,000 Do you a few years ago when we still had 28 people and the convention center was coming and saying we need this money and you and some others gave all and then we gave another 30 million under the alderman from the 7th, Alderman Coder, is that right? No, we gave <laughs> 40 million. Oh, okay, 40, okay. So when, have you seen something in North St. Louis getting done that I haven't seen? No. Are you opposed to there being economic activity in North St. Louis? Am I opposed to what? I'm sorry. Are there being something happening in North St. Louis? No, We're building I'm not housing, opposed. No. Helping the seniors with their home improvements, any of that? No. I know I'm not, and I don't believe the older woman from the 11th is, and we represent about 90% of uh, North St. Louis. Right. And um, the only thing I do know is that we were all opposed by uh, people, this administration and the president, and they lost, okay? I do know that part and that we won. So it almost seems like we're going to punish the older people um, by not spending the money. And so um, can you see any reason we would give any more money to the convention center when we can't get any money spent ourselves in our community? I, I do not. And I feel that we're putting money in a black hole. And so I think that uh, the person that's over the convention center dealing with the construction, they need to present to us a package because we haven't seen anything tell us it's not going to be any different, that they're not going to keep coming back. And so I'm just asking that we hold this bill because we need to look at how we can ensure that uh, they don't come back. And if the county is not giving us any dollars, then we need to stop and not give dollars, and then we need to make sure that they have in our ordinance that they cannot come back to us for any more dollars. So what happens in your families or in other families that you represent if they don't have enough money to do things? Don't they have to scale back? Right, right. Do you believe that the most important thing to the citizens in North St. Louis is that we can finish the convention center? Is that what somebody's been telling you in your community? Right, no. They haven't been telling me to do anything for the convention center. Not ever have I heard that in 33 years, that, oh, put some more money downtown. No. When I came down here, the biggest thing they had mostly was the mansion house. When I say literally we've spent billions of dollars, and you do know that there's a segment of downtown now that wants to partner with North St. Louis. If, if we get money in, that they can spend some money and we can too. That's been, uh, we've been yeah, approached by Yeah, that's what the, they proposed right. to us, correct. And, but 
the fact of it is they'll probably get the money and we still won't get any. And then our constituents will say, well, why can't we get money? And when we try to explain to them that we appropriate money that's not being spent, they don't understand that, do they? No, and so they're blaming us because they're telling us where is the money. So we can't answer the question. So have you got any kind of accounting about the, fi the two $500? You know, we gave one set of $500 out, and they said we gave that, and then we gave another $500, I believe, 500 or 450 people who had children in schools. Do you have any accounting from that at all? No, we I, I have not. We keep getting different numbers. We haven't got the information. And again, I, I, I'm on where you are with uh, Katie Radcliffe. I hadn't heard from Katie until the other day. And so I'm just appalled because I just think that's disrespectful. She hasn't connected with us to talk to us about this, and now she's coming and saying, you know, we need to be the saviors. Well, I don't want to save her because they're not trying to save North St. Louis. So, no, I can't do that. And, and I would say that um, I want to say when I first came back, I was on HUD's. Oh, I don't know. Or maybe I was on convention and tourism. So it was before one of them. We had conversations about, you know, the monies that's been spent downtown and why it was so important, um, because we have all these hotels that need to be filled. And so it seems like to me, and maybe you have a different perspective, is that when there is something happening downtown, a fingernail broken, it has to be fixed. But we have a whole thing with these vacant properties, LRAs. Our citizens didn't make those properties vacant. Right. They're not the people, they're the people that are still there dealing with that. We can't, I passed a resolution um, over a year ago um, about LRA properties and what should be done, grass getting cut and things like that, and we should have a meeting. I want you to know we haven't been able to meet. I did reintroduce it. I'm going to ask for a hearing. If it doesn't happen, I'm going to introduce it again. Because while you're talking about the convention and tourism, we're dealing with seven, over seven to 8,000 vacant properties in the city of St. Louis. 90% of them are in, um, are in the communities, and we can't find a solution. But if there's a restaurant who feels like that they're being slighted by not getting uh, liquor fast enough or their short-term rentals downtown, we have to resolve that right away. To, to me, that doesn't seem to be a fair application of concern for citizens across this, the city. And I just want to know, what is your uh, thoughts about how things are treated when there's a problem in different parts of the city? Well, I have spoke on this continuously. Again, the city is separated. It hasn't changed. I agree with our woman Swicer when she pushed about fixing the water main uh, lines because we keep telling them it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And so them coming and saying we need to fix the uh, convention center, I, I don't think that's our issue. I think our issue is the infrastructure in our city and the buildings that are unsafe where people can get hurt and or die. So in North St. Louis, again, we're not getting these things done. And so I heard Auto Woman Spencer talk about the staffing and the trash and stuff. But the issue is not the staffing and the trash. The issue is how we are getting these people to come in to our city to work. And that's not happening. We're not getting that done. And I know it, it's in your capacity, you have worked real hard because you have the largest geographical area in the city as it relates to a ward. I have the actual physical of having three North St. Louis wards now. They call it one, but it's, I actually have the whole old 20th ward, uh, the entire old 4th ward, and then parts of the 18th, 22nd, uh, 1st, and second, so that's like, to have, and part of the 21st, yeah. So that's like having three wards in North St. Louis, and you probably got that many too. Um, so you have worked real hard to clean up parts of uh, the old 22nd ward. I go down page, I see where you had grass cut and working on it. Um, and you're, so besides being an older person, one of the things you have to do in North St. Louis is you have to be like, even if you have a neighborhood specialist, you still are a neighborhood improvement specialist, you are doing all of these things because they don't get done. Even if the neighborhood improvement specialist turns them in, they just go to citizen service where the, for good ideas go to die. Is that right? 
And right. If the older person is not on the phone behind them saying, hey, you need to get out here. They don't get done. Right. 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 So it is almost impossible now with this great idea of going to 14 for you and I to get things done on a hands on basis that we used to do. Is that right? Exactly. And so people who think that this is great, or people thought, oh, Sharon, you don't want this because you think you were going to lose. I never thought I was going to lose. I just know it's a bad idea for North St. Louis. It is not. We have less black representation. We have people coming and telling us what's good for us and passing laws that they have no idea. They don't own anything. They have no idea of how things operate. But they come in their great brains and say, this is a great idea. And then... It's not a great idea, and they don't care. So um, I guess my question becomes, how do we get this money spent? If you have any idea, what happens? What do we do? Because I want to take responsibility that we do to get this money spent so that we don't have people coming here. Okay, we need $15 million more. Oh, this is interest here, which, by the way, at first they didn't even put the money in an interest-bearing account. So for the first five months... The treasurer didn't even put the money in an interest bearer in the county. You have enough nerves to be running for a re-election. If the dog runs against him, I'm voting for woof, woof, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know, who, how do you run for re-election? You can't even put money in a bank account. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm voting for him because that's ridiculous. So is there anything you can think of that we can do more except for vote for stuff, call about it? Uh, get on this floor and compare that when you're asking for more money, why we can't support it is because we don't even know if we're going to need any more money because we haven't got any money spent. When you talk about $100,000 being spent across North St. Louis, that's the same thing we found out about nuisance properties. One nuisance property in five years uh, closed in all of North St. Louis. At some point, does this feel purposeful to you? No. Is there a purpose? I, I just to- feel like we're working against ourselves because we keep going over the same thing over and over again. So anyway, I thank you for um, um, yielding to my questions. It just makes me really sad um, being here 30 something years and I don't see things getting better. I see them getting worse and worse and I see people leaving at a rapid rate from this city and people think that that's all right. Just wait until it hits your communities. It will not stop at North St. Louis, you think you're insulated from it. I remember so many times the other aldermen when we had 28 thinking they were insulated and then calling me up and saying, now how are you dealing with that problem? Because the problem is encroaching. And I can see it when I drive down, I lived in South St. Louis for a lot of years. And so when I drive down Chippewa between Kings Highway and Hampton, I see a different group of people that are in those apartments. Keep watching, you'll get to see all this stuff. Hopefully you don't ever have to deal with as many vacant LRE properties, but that is not our problem, that it should be the LRA and the city's problem. And, and leaving vacant buildings in communities to demoralize the people will make them leave. So if that is your purpose, that is what you're doing. And if you then keep giving the money saying, well, we got to do this for the convention center, and that is your purpose is to run people, particularly black middle class, out of the city. Don't worry about it. You're doing it. And it's also the people who might have voted for you but will never again in life. A further discussion, Alderman from the 14th. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee with the Alderman from the third ward yield for question. Alderman from the third yield to questioning from the Alderman from the 14th. Alderman, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Alderman, uh, if if I'm not mistaken, uh, did you send out an email about touring the convention center? I've uh, probably sent out a couple of them actually offering uh, tours of the convention center and the progress that's being made with respect to the construction and upgrades. And did you uh, send that email to the full board, Alderman, or did you send it to like a certain committee? Uh, I have done both. I've sent it directly to the Transportation and Commerce Committee members, and I've also sent it out to the full board of aldermen. Gotcha. So it was, and, and I was looking 
at the email you sent back in January 26th, and then you followed up on January 29th to remind people, and it was sent out to the full board. Did you attend the tour of the convention center? I, I did not attend that one, but I had one the following week with the CEO of the CVC, Kitty Ratcliffe. Okay. And in that conversation, did she talk about the future of the convention center and some of the money that was needed uh, for that project as you had a one-on-one -on -one with her? She did. Okay. Thank you, Alderman. That's all I have. Uh, um, I will say, I, uh, you know, part of the convention center touches the 14th Ward, um, and I do support uh, the bill. Um, I think the, the bigger issue um, that is being raised is, I guess, my concern of how we got here. Or actually, I'll do one more. Will the alderman of the 8th Ward yield? The alderwoman of the 8th yield to the alderman from the 14th. Yielding. <laughs> hey there, downtown friend. Hi. I know we share downtown. We do. Um, so I know you have this piece of legislation, but before you filed this legislation, um, were you uh, kind of out there somehow told that you were going to file a different piece of legislation before you even knew about it? I was told nothing, uh, but I did read about a piece of legislation that it was presumed I would be introduced. Yes, that's to what you're referring. Yes, that there was uh, something that was put out that said you was filing actually 20 million, we're at 15 now, but that you was filing 20 million. Is that true? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, again, like I said, I support this. I think the convention center is uh, something that is, is critical to the economic engine of our city. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, the way that we've gotten to this process uh, has been because the board hasn't really been included in it. It was uh, conversations that was had um, from what the executive director said from other offices um, throughout the city of St. Louis, which puts the board in a place, place where uh, it was released in the business journal that um, we agree to $20 million, and then after we talked with Ms. Ravcliffe, we still don't even know if that is enough. Um, it is, I, if, I, if other offices would, I think, be, have just a little bit more um, respect and understanding that this is a legislative body, and when you have these ideas, uh, you need to have those conversations with the full body. Um, it wouldn't put us in spots where we are kind of, um, dividing or not having a full conversation about ARPA dollars as a whole. Um, I think we deserve more respect as the Board of Aldermen uh, for that. We should be included in all these conversations and not behind the uh, scenes conversation, especially as we got to vote on those. However, understanding that um, the Convention Center is in need of money, um, I think this is a, a great idea. Originally, it was so that we was going to touch Ram's money, which we have made it very clear at this board alderman that we're not doing that. Um, and I'm glad that we was able to just figure out the interest element of it. Um, I hope this is uh, a start that uh, Ms. Ratcliffe could be able to use these funds to get the convention center up and moving. Uh, as we've seen, we just had the volleyball tournament. We had monster trucks. So it, it does bring in... This isn't just a downtown thing. It does bring in a lot of tourism. It does bring in a lot of dollars for our city, which is beneficial. Um, but at the end of the day, when we make these decisions, I think uh, out of respect, other departments and offices should give this Board of Aldermen the due respect and not uh, tell us at the last minute and have us scrambling instead of on the front end. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Alderwoman from the 8th, you are recognized to close. Thank you, Madam President and members of the board. I wanted to address um, an issue that the older woman from the first brought up, um, and that is uh, investing in, in, in our water infrastructure. Um, you know, she made an excellent point that when talking about our population loss, the city that is losing population faster than the city of St. Louis has is, is got a water issue, and it's a very serious one. Um, the city of St. Louis sits at the confluence of our nation's largest waterways. I mean, the Mississippi, we have access to the largest amount of fresh moving water um, that 
the United States has. The city of St. Louis has access to that. Uh, it's an incredible asset. And we saw just uh, 10 years ago the city of St. Louis contemplate privatizing that, uh, that water uh, um, uh, production facility that we have, which would be a huge loss. Right now, um, as we're looking at climate change and a, a massive shift um, in, in, in the world and, and what, are, what, is, what is valuable to cities, I think water is going to be an asset uh, that uh, we're currently undervaluing, but um, will certainly be of um, incredible importance moving forward. So I take the point that we should be prioritizing this. I want to remind this uh, the, this body, but also um, anybody watching, that you know the the federal government in 2021 announced 111 billion dollars federal funding for municipal municipalities and water departments. 111 billion dollars. At that time, um, the um, U.S. environmental, the EPA administrator, Michael Regan, came to the city of St. Louis, came and took a tour, and said, hey, we're going to invest in the city of St. Louis, or at least that's what we were doing by, our, by the administration. If you do the calculations, $111 billion, and you divide that out equally across the United States, that's $323 per person on average, okay? $323 per person. Multiply that by the current population of the city of St. Louis. We're looking at $110 million. That would be if we got the average, okay? And we are a high-need city. So I would argue that our allotment of that federal funding should be a lot more than that, more than $110 million. Where is the federal funding that our city of St. Louis needs and deserves out of that enormous pot of federal funds? It is nothing short of tragedy. It is, it is an abdication of our duty to not be going after the, that enormous federal pot of money for our water infrastructure. I do not disagree that we should be putting some of the ARPA funds, that we should have done that. Had we known at that time what dire straits our water department is, we would have done that, no doubt. But this Board of Aldermen can't do its job if we don't have the information that we need. Without transparency, without communication that was alluded to by my colleague from the 14th, without coordination and collaboration with our city departments, with our administration, we cannot do our job, okay? And we have been unable to do it in many instances, and our water department is a very clear example of that. But I don't want that to hold us up. I am committed to doing that work. I am committed to taking a look at where the federal funding is going because it isn't coming here and what it is that we need to do as a city to make sure that we get our fair share, that our water department can stay solvent, that we can continue to serve not only the city of St. Louis but sell that water to the rest of the region because we produce enough water for a million residents and we have a tiny fraction of that here left. So. With that, I, I, I want to say that the Alderwoman the first brings up an excellent point. I agree with you entirely. There are some pots of money we should be looking at, and that should be a top priority moving forward. But with that, I do agree. I do want to point, re, re, reiterate that investing in economic activity, investing in our convention center is crucial to having a vibrant or even functioning downtown uh, and uh, path for economic growth. And so w the convention center is the doorway, is the front door to many businesses and prospective residents and prospective investors in our community. And it needs to be top notch. It needs to be invested in. It needs to uh, uh, be able to welcome future investment um, with the amenities that we've promised. And with that, I ask for your favorable consideration, and I want to know what is. <laughs> I renew my motion, Ms. Madam President. Great. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the ACE, seconded by the Alderwoman from. Can I get you? Roll call. Uh, Point of order. Did you recognize her for closing? I'm I sorry. I did, yes. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 8th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we perfect board bill number 220. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. 
Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Vollmer. Alderwoman Velasquez. Aye. Alderwoman Sanye. Aye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Aye. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderwoman Keys. Aye. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. Aye. President Green. Aye. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Vollmer. 11 aye votes and four no votes. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderwoman from the 8th to perfect board bill number 220. Board Bill 228, sponsored by Alderman Cohn. An ordinance recommended and approved by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, authorizing and directing the Director of Airports and the Comptroller of the City of St. Louis to enter into and execute on behalf of the City on airport passenger vehicle rental concession agreement with the concessionaires listed on Exhibit B, containing the severability clause. Alderman from the 3rd, you are recognized on the perfection of Board Bill 228. Thank you, Madam President. I move that we uh, perfect Board Bill 228. It's been moved by the alderwoman, Alderman from the 3rd, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we perfect Board Bill number 228. Alderman, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this Board Bill uh, is one that was uh, introduced by a suspension of the rules last Friday. We had a committee hearing on it uh, this week. Um, this is an agreement between the airport and uh, vehicle rental companies, concessionaires at the airport, um, and I would ask for your all's favorable consideration. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, it's been moved by the alderman from the 3rd, seconded by the alderwoman from the 7th, that we perfect board bill number 228. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Vollmer. Alderwoman Velasquez. Alderwoman Sanye. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderwoman Keys. Aye. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Aye. 14 aye votes and one abstain. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderman from the 3rd to perfect board bill number 228. Report of engrossment. Board Bill 79199, committee sub as amended, 212, 214, 215, and 216. Third reading and final passage of board bill's consent. Board Bill 79, 199, Committee Sub, 212, 214, 215, and 216. Alderwoman from the 10th, you are recognized on the motion to adopt the third reading and final passage of board bills on the consent calendar. Thank you, Madam President. I move that we adopt the third reading and final passage of board bills on the consent calendar. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we adopt uh, the uh, third reading and final passage of board bills on the consent calendar. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderman Odenberg. Aye. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Alderman Narayan. Aye. Alderman Vollmer. <laughs> Alderwoman Velasquez. Alderwoman Sanye. Aye. Alderwoman Spencer. Aye. Alderman Browning. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Aye. Alderwoman Keys. Aye. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Aye. 15 aye votes. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderwoman from the 10th to third read and finally pass the aforementioned bills. Third reading and final passage of board bills. Board Bill 79, 19, 199, committee sub as amended. 
212, 214, 215, and 216. All other business being suspended, the president shall in open session affix her signature here to demand that these may become law. First reading of resolutions and reference to committee. Resolution number 206, introduced by Alderman Browning, co-sponsor Clark Hubbard. The board, bill recon the board of Alderman recognized March 2, 2024 as in endo Endometriosis Awareness Month and further recognizes the importance of endometriosis as a health issue for women that requires far greater attention, public awareness, and education about the disease. Alderman from the ninth, you are recognized on the first reading of resolution. Thank you. Uh, would the clerk mind reading the resolution aloud? Resolution 206 recognizing March as Endometriosis Awareness Month. Whereas more than 6.5 million women in the United States are living with endometriosis. Whereas endometriosis is a chronic disease that can be painful and debilitating and affects approximately 190 women, I'm sorry, 190 million women throughout the world. An estimated one in, one in 10 women of reproductive age in the United States and primarily women in their 30s and 40s, but can affect any women who menstruates. Whereas the cause of endometriosis is not known, but risk factors include having a mother, sister or daughter with endometriosis, menstrual cycles that start at an early age, menstrual cycles that are short and periods that are heavy and last longer than seven days. In, 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 endometriosis occurs when tissue similar to that of the lining of the uterus begins to grow outside the uterus. Whereas for many women, the only way currently available to certain endometriosis diagnosis is to have a surgical procedure known as laparoscopy. Whereas the primary symptoms of endometriosis include pain, infertility, and many women with endometriosis live with debilitating chronic pain. Whereas symptoms of anxiety and depression are common among women with endometriosis with reported rates as high as 75 to 90 percent. And whereas although endometriosis is one, is one of the most common gynecological disorders in the United States, there is a lack of awareness and prioritization of endometriosis as an important health issue for women. Whereas women can suffer from endometriosis for up to 10 years before being properly diagnosed. Whereas 75% of the women with endometriosis experience a misdiagnosis. Whereas the man management of symptoms of endometriosis may include low doses, may include low dose of oral contraceptive, IUD, painkillers, non-steroid inflammatory drug. And gonadotropin releases hormone agonist therapy. Whereas IV is often recognized as the best option for patients experiencing endometriosis 
infertility and for, home, and for whom initial surgery was unsuccessful. Whereas endometriosis is associated with current, with increased health care costs and poses a substantial burden to patients in the health care system. Whereas in the United States, the, average, the estimated average direct health care costs associated with endometriosis per, parent, per patient is more than $13,000 per year. Whereas 40% of the women with endometriosis report impaired career growth due to endometriosis and approximately 50% of the women with endometriosis experience a decreased ability to work. And whereas the Center for Disease Control Prevention found that average number of bed days for patients with endometriosis was 18 days per year. Whereas women with endometriosis can, call, can lose 11 hours per work week through lost productivity. Whereas the physical and psychological impact of endometriosis affect all domains of life, including, including social life, relationship, and work. Whereas medical societies and patient groups have expressed the need for greater public attention and updated resource targeted to public education about this unmet health need for women. Whereas there is a need for more research and updated guidelines to treat endometriosis. Whereas there is an ongoing need for additional clinical research and treatment options to manage this debilitating disease. And whereas there is no known cure for endometriosis. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Board of Aldermen recognize March 2024 as Endometriosis Awareness Month and further recognize the importance of endometriosis as a health issue for women that require greater attention, public awareness, and education about the disease. We further direct the clerk of this board to spread a copy of this resolution across the minutes of the proceedings and prepare a commemorative copy to the end that it may be presented to at a place and time deemed appropriate by the sponsor. Introduce this eighth day of March, 2024, by the Honorable Michael Brown, Alderman of the 9th Ward, and Shameen Clark Hubbard, Alderwoman of the 10th Ward. Alderman, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, this resolution is based off of wording uh, and a resolution that was passed by the U.S. Senate, uh, sponsored by Senator Tammy Duckworth, uh, and I want to thank her for that work. Um, I think it's uh, important to acknowledge March as Endometriosis Awareness Month because uh, it is a commonly misunderstood and unacknowledged disease that women suffer. Um, it's a chronic disease that approximately 10% of women, non-binary folk, uh, trans men, anyone with a uterus might experience uh, during their reproductive age, where the interior lining of the uterus grows outside of the uterus and causes painful scarring and lesions. Uh, one of the side effects is extremely, extremely painful menstrual periods, but another side effect can be infertility. In fact, um, it's not something that can be understood or uh, diagnosed through a scan or a test. The only way it can be diagnosed is via surgery, and many people find out they have it when they are seeking treatment for infertility. So greater awareness is definitely needed. Uh, the reason I care about this issue is that my wife, Sarah, has endometriosis, and it took seven years for her to get it diagnosed. Uh, we went to four different gynecologists, and at one point, one of them even told her to go to a psychologist because she might be exaggerating the pain and that it was an issue of anxiety and not actual endometriosis. Thankfully, we finally found care at the SLU Center for en Endometriosis, and I remember she came home and she cried that day because someone finally believed her. This disease keeps people in a debilitating state sometimes. As the resolution mentions, you can be bedridden, you can lose days of your year, hours of your work week, and it's all for something that you might not even realize you have because I'm sure even some of you today are learning for the first time of this disease. It took almost a year for us to get an appointment and another several months for her to get the surgery called a laparoscopy, uh, which has finally led to her being able to lead her fullest life. And I don't want anyone to go through this. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge this today, uh, that people understand that if you're experiencing these symptoms, that you can go and you can get checked out and you can ask your doctor about this, because no one deserves to be disbelieved 
when they go and they go to their doctor and they complain of pain or infertility. Uh, it's not normal uh, to have that much pain, and don't let your doctor tell you what you're experiencing isn't real. So I really ask that we pass this today, and uh, thank you all for your time. Do you want to request unanimous consent? I would, yes. Uh, it's hearing no objection to <laughs> unanimous consent. Would you like to make a motion to adopt resolution? Yes, uh, I would like to make a resolution that we adopt resolution 206. Uh, now I'll entertain that second. Okay, thank you. So it's been moved by the alderman from the 9th, seconded by the alderman from the 14th, that we adopt resolution 06. Any further discussion? Alderwoman from the 12th. I want to thank the alderman from um, the 9th for this resolution. It's a very important uh, resolution. Um, a lot of women, doctors don't believe them. When they go to see the doctors, they tell them it's in their head. Oh, you're just imagining things, and endometriosis is something very close to me because I've had it myself, and this past year and a half ago ended up with um, some other complications from that. But um, women of color have it more often. Um, uh, uh, Arabic women, Jewish women, people with brown skins tend to have it more often. They haven't come up with a reason why, but it can affect your entire life. And so um, I'm glad that you're sponsoring this as a man. That means you're very sensitive to women's issues, and I appreciate that. And I don't often ask for this, but I would love to have this passed in bank, if you don't mind. It's been moved by the alderwoman from the 12th, seconded by the alderwoman from the 1st, that we make resolution 206 in bank. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Alderwoman from the 11th. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, in two, well, throughout my reproductive life, um, endometriosis affected me. They just didn't have a name for it. We had fertility issues. Um, and uh, finally, we were able to uh, give birth to three uh, boys. Uh, naturally. Uh, then uh, in 2005, I was evaluated for a uterine cancer excitement, only to find out in 2006 that it was endometriosis and I had to have surgery, which was supposed to be a very easy laparoscopic surgery, and I was supposed to go home 45 minutes after that. Um, nothing was even close to that. I ended up on the operating table for seven and a half hours. Uh, it was touch and go. I was in the hospital for about a month and a half. Um, and so when we talk about endometriosis, which is a term that most people have never heard of um, and don't have much knowledge about, um, it is a very difficult thing for the medical uh, industry to, to navigate. Um, and more so, it is uh, very heart-wrenching uh, for women who are going through this thing to not have a name for it. You don't know what to call it. You don't know why it's happening. Um, so Alderman Browning, I, I thank you so, so much uh, for, for bringing this um, resolution. It is, it is much needed to bring awareness so that people understand that this is a real uh, condition. The woman ties, we lived through this thing. And um, I finally got some relief with my surgery in 2000. Six, but even beyond that, I had to go to physical therapy to walk because I had so much atrophy. Um, so it's, it's just a lot that goes into this thing, and people just truly don't understand. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Let's take a moment of personal privilege, and I would like to thank Alderman Browning for bringing this forth as well. Um, I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 15 after missing six months of my sophomore year of high school because of being in extreme pain and nobody knew why. And it wasn't until actually I read an article in Seventeen Magazine that described endometriosis that I finally uh, was able to go to my mom and said, I think this is what's going on. And we finally found the right doctor, um, had the surgery, and um, and was able to get back into life as a teenager. But thank you for raising the issue and the awareness. It's definitely something that more folks need to know about. 
So with that, it has been moved by the alderman from the 9th, seconded by the alderman from the 14th, that we adopt resolution number 206. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Resolution 207, sponsored by Alderman Narayan, recognizing Irish Heritage Month, Heritage Month, displaying the Irish flag at City Hall. Alderman from the 4th, you're recognized on the uh, first reason, reading of Resolution 207. Thank you, uh, Madam President, members of the board, I request you unanimous. Hearing no objection, Alderman, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I know that I've, I've spoken to uh, many of uh, the folks in here about uh, the, the, the various uh, uh, issues and celebrations and things uh, uh, with the Asian American community. Uh, the other half of me is Irish American uh, from uh, County Kerry. Um, so uh, I, I don't advocate for those issues as much because uh, my, the, 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 they the Irish Americans have plenty of advocates over the years, frankly. Um, but uh, being uh, uh, my dad from India, my mom being Irish American and being born here in America, uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, informed me that most of my family history is about uh, asking the British to leave, uh, <laughs> which uh, is, is funny to me. Um, so uh, as many of you know, I represent the, uh, the area of Dogtown, which uh, has been historically settled by the Irish since the late 1700s. It's where a, a, a lot of the uh, brick that we see throughout the city of St. Louis comes from, the Missouri Red Brick. Um, this year uh, is the 40th year that the Hibernians have done the Dogtown uh, Parade on St. Patrick's Day, down Tam Avenue. Uh, there was a, a split years ago as a result of some uh, political disagreements. Uh, but in honor of that 40th year, uh, one of the things that the Hibernians uh, and the Irish American community have asked is to raise the, the, the tricolor, the Irish flag, in honor of that 40th uh, celebration. Uh, I believe they want to do it on the 15th. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is on the 17th and uh, keep that flag flying for a little while there. Um, and I would ask for your favorable consideration. Would you like to make a motion to adopt Resolution 207? I, I would make a, a motion that we adopt <laughs> Resolution uh, 207. 207. It's been moved by the alderman from the 4th, seconded by the alderwoman from the 10th, that we adopt Resolution 207. Any further discussion, alderwoman from the 10th? Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I would just like to ask for um, the opportunity to stand in support and solidarity with you and unanimous consent. <laughs> Any further discussion? Any further discussion? It's been moved by the alderman from the 4th, seconded by the alderwoman from the 10th, uh, that we adopt resolution number 207. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. That's the extent of first reading report of standing committees. I'm Second sorry. reading of resolutions, committee reports, and adoptions. Report from the HUDS committee. Mayor's appointment of Patrick Hughes and Brandon Smart to the Tax Increment Financing Committee. Alder woman from the 10th, you're recognized on Mayor Jones' appointments to the uh, I'm sorry, did you say tax increment financing? Commission. Commission, okay. My agenda says differently. Right. So. <laughs> you want me to do those first? Go ahead, Alderwoman from the okay. Uh I move that we approve the mayor's appointments to the tax increment financing. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderman, was that from the 4th or the 2nd? 2nd. Uh, that we approve Mayor Jones' appointments to the uh, TIF Commission. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Mayor's appointment of Gary Reed, Victor Zarelli, and Shine King to the Industrial Development Authority. Alderwoman from the 10th, you are recognized on Mayor Jones' appointments to the Industrial uh, Development Authority. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we approve Mayor Jones' appointments to the Industrial Development. 
there a second? It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 1st, that we approve Mayor Jones' appointments to the Industrial uh, Development Authority. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That's the extent of second reading, committee reports, and adoption. Alderman from the second, you are recognized on the motion to suspend the rules for the purposes of introducing courtesy resolution 209. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, I move to suspend the rules for the purposes of introducing courtesy resolution 209. Second. It's been moved by the alderman from the second, seconded by the alderwoman from the 10th, that we suspend the rules for the purposes of introducing courtesy resolution uh, 209. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Schweitzer. Alderman Oldenburg. Aye. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Balmer. Alderman Velasquez. Alderman Sanye. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Alderman Keys. Aye. Alderman Tyus. Alderman Boyd. Alderman Aldridge. President Green. Aye. Alderman Cone. Alderman Boyd. 13 aye votes. By your vote, you sustain the motion from the Alderman from the second. Madam Clerk, if you could please place resolution 209 at the end of the courtesy resolution. So noted. Courtesy resolutions. Alderwoman from the 10th, you are recognized on the motion to adopt the courtesy resolution consent calendar. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we adopt the courtesy resolutions consent calendar. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 7th, that we adopt the courtesy resolution consent calendar. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Miscellaneous and unfinished business. We have none. Announcements. Monday, March 11, 2024, Special Committee on Long-Term Health Care, 3 p.m. in the Kennedy Room. That's the extent of the announcements. Any further announcements? Any further announcements? Alderwoman from the first. Thank you, thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I'd like to announce on Wednesday, March 13th, Transform 314 will have a community meeting regarding complete streets at 6 p.m. And on Thursday, March 14th, members of this board and your staff are welcome to participate in a complete streets workshop at noon. Uh, and you should have received an email about that. Thank you so much. Alderwoman from the 10th. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I would like to announce this Sunday, March 10th at 3 p.m. It's a When Black Women Lead Town Hall that many of us are participating in at New Sunny Mount at 3 p.m. Uh, and then I'd also like to tag on to Alderwoman Swicer's announcements on March 14th, better known as 314 Day. There are so many events going on. If you love St. Louis the way we love St. Louis, you show up and show up, show out for St. Louis, then make sure you tap into some of the many, again, many events that are going on for 314 Day. In the West End, we're having 314 Day from 4 to 6 at Frank Williamson Senior Park. And then also I have to shout out my brothers, my family at Pure Catering um, on 314 Day. It's in the morning. You got to wake up early, but <laughs> it's at 6 a.m. It's a um, live broadcast from the Carmel Room presented by Pure down in Alderman uh, Aldridge's board. It's going to have a live broadcast by Foxy 106.9. It's going to have a carry, $10 carry out, con, I'm sorry, carry out or dine in. And they're also going to have a Nina Pop contest. So again, this is at 1600 North Broadway. It's the 314 day, 314 versus everybody at, at the Cuomo Room presented by Pure. I hope to see you all there. Any further announcements? Any further announcements? Alderman from the 14th. Thank you, Madam President, members of the uh, board, Alderman. Thank you for Alderman from the 10th uh, for reminding people of 314 days coming up. As we prep for 314 day for the culture, STL actually this Sunday uh, at 3 p.m., 314, so 314, 
uh, will be gathering down at the Arch to take a big uh, photo celebration. And after 314 Day, all my colleagues can text me a happy birthday as I turn 30. So don't forget about me. Alder woman from the 7th. Thank you, President, Madam President, members of the board. Now, instead of people calling you 12, they call you 15, Alderman. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I announced the office hours that we have coming up since we'll be going on spring break. And I know constituents do watch this meeting to kind of learn about things. So if you have a question about anything, if you want to just come support a local business, I know we've got a lot of things going on. On March 26th, I'll be at Chimera T, which is a new black women-owned business in Fox Park that I'm so excited to celebrate. And then um, later that, and I'll be there from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And then that evening from 5 to 6.30 p.m., I will be at Yaki's. Thank you. Any further announcements? Any further announcements? Alderwoman from the 10th, you are recognized on the motion to excuse. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. All members were present this morning. Alderwoman from the 10th, you are recognized on the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I move that we adjourn until Friday, March 29th, 2024, in the Board of Alderman Chambers. It's been moved by the Alderwoman from the 10th, seconded by the Alderwoman from the 8th, that we adjourn until Friday, March 29th, 2024. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Aye.